Hi, Elliot. Can you hear us? Thank you. It's muted. Elliot, are you muted? Uh, I was, yeah, I was muted. Sorry about that. Good. You sound good. You're doing well. Yeah. Can you hear them now? Elliot can't hear anybody talking. Here. Okay, I'd like to uh, call to order uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting of January 19th, 2023. Um, we have four public hearings scheduled for this evening, so I want to take a few minutes to review the process for public hearings. During the public hearing, the applicant will be invited to join as a panelist to present the application, explaining to the commission and others present what is being requested. The applicant or staff will share all application materials on the screen here as needed and for Zoom attendees. Comments of town agencies will be read for each application if there are any. There will be clarifying questions from the commissioners first. Then there will be an opportunity for clarifying questions from attendees. Please raise your hand through the Zoom platform or here and wait to be called on. Um, those who wish to support the application come forward next and then those who oppose the application may come forward. As this public hearing must be recorded, it is necessary for speakers to identify themselves each time they speak by stating their name and address. The applicant will then have an opportunity to address any questions or concerns raised by the public or commissioners. Uh, once the public hearing is closed, the applicant is free to leave or remain for the balance of the regular meeting during which the commission will try to reach a decision on each application. Each applicant will be notified in writing as to the decision of this commission and has a right to appeal to superior court if desired. Decisions of this meeting are available the day after the meeting by calling the Land Use Department at 203-245-5631 after 9 a.m. All actions taken tonight by the commission will be by roll call. All commissioners and staff will identify themselves for the record before speaking. Seated this evening are the following members, and I'm gonna read this in alph alphabetical order, and I'm hoping everyone can just raise a hand to identify yourselves. Um, and we have a combination of commissioners here at town campus and um, also attending by Zoom. So seated this evening are John Duza, Elliot Hitchcock on Zoom, John Morgan, new commissioner, Bob O'Connor, Janet Peckinpah, Bob Reinhardt, new commissioner, and myself, Carol Snow. Um, Welcome new commissioners. And I think maybe at our next planning session, we'll have time to do more introductions for new people and even old people. <laughs> Staff present this evening is Aaron Mannix, town planner. This meeting is live streamed on YouTube and will be made available on the town website for viewing. Additionally, I would like to ask that we treat each other respectfully throughout the meeting. And the town planner, Aaron Mannix, will now read the legal notice. I didn't have that ready. <laughs> Sorry. Aaron, you were shocked. <laughs> you did so much other preparation. Maybe that was yeah, a I mean, paragraph that got left out. 
Hi, welcome. Notice is hereby given that the, the Madison Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing on Thursday, January 19, 2023, at 7 p.m. in meeting room A, Town Campus, 8 Campus Drive, Madison, Connecticut, 06443. This is a hybrid meeting, and attendees may also join the hearing via Zoom webinar through either the webinar link or call in information below. The webinar ID is 915-8196. 6735. Passcode is 452138. Call in number is 646 558 8656. The following applications will be heard 22 25 plus coastal site plan 1362 Boston Post Road, map 31, lot 38 slash 1, zone R2. Owner applicant, Town of Madison, special exception permit modification to convert 21,504 square feet of undeveloped area into a closed dog park. This application includes a coastal site plan review. Application number 22-32, 32 New Road, Map 49, Lot 25, Light Industrial Zone. Applicant is Thomas A. Stevens & Associates, Inc. Owner is RWT Corporation. Special permit application for section 7.1 to construct 60 foot by 114 foot, 6,802 square foot overall, one story addition to the rear of existing manufacturing building, and demolition of 1,351 square foot portion of rear detached building. Application 22 30, 300 Green Hill Road, map 64, lot 36, zone RU2, owner applicant, town of Madison, special exception permit to remove four existing tennis courts and replace with six courts. Application number 22 33, applicant, Frazier Moulage, petition for regulation amendment to Madison Zoning Regulations, section 32, plan development district. Copies of these applications are available for inspection in the land use office. Further details on how to participate in the webinar are posted on the Town of Madison website, www.madisonct.org. All written correspondence can be submitted to the land use department via email to landuse at madisonct.org. Dial 203-245-5631 for assistance. Dated at Madison, Connecticut, this 20th day of December, Carol Snow, Chair. This legal notice was published once in the source on January 5th, 2023, and once on January 12th, 2023. Thank you, Erin. Um, so we'll move right into the public hearings. Uh, could I have a motion to open the public hearing for 22-25 plus CSP, 1362 Boston Post Road? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, open the public hearing. Great, we're open. And could we have our presenter? Austin Hall, Hall, Director of Beach and Recreation Department is here uh, for this application. Austin, um, the owl will turn to you once you, you begin speaking, um, but it, you, you may just want one set designation <laughs> to, to sit. We'll see if we can find you here. Well, okay, yeah. so thank you for, for having us tonight. Um, <clears throat> so really excited to um, get this project on to the public hearing list. Um, this has been a project that B2 Records worked on for many years now, and we are excited to hopefully come to a, uh, a finalizing of it um, shortly. So we have Salt Meadow Park, uh, which is on the Boston Post Road heading towards Clinton. Um, we have an area as you drive into the park to the left is an open space area that, um, as you see in the top left corner, um, administration service for you, so our attendees. Okay, so we have the entrance here. So that roundish looking area on the top left of the screen there, that is the area. Um, that uh, the town uh, and the salt 
Meadow Advisory Committee uh, has deemed to be a great location for the dog park. Um, we have gone through uh, many iterations and have gone through um, your advisory committee, ACA, and taken all of their um, recommendations and made them into this presentation, which, which you're seeing today. So originally, uh, it was a square or a rectangular area, and ACA uh, recommended that we make it more flowing and fit into the, the park more. So that's what we did. Uh, we originally had uh, the park as a chain link fence, a five foot chain link fence. And ACA recommended that we not use a chain link fence and make it more you know, visually appealing um, and go with uh, cedar post and rail fencing, which I think will look fantastic and fit into the whole scope and scheme of what Salt Meadow Park is. So it'll be a five foot tall cedar post and rail, so four rails to get to the five feet with weld wire on the inside to prevent you know, dogs from climbing the, the post and rail. There'll be two entrances. So one entrance will be a double gate. So if you've been to a dog park before, I like to use the built one as an example. There's the unleashing area as you come in. So you bring your dog through a gate, unleash them, then you go through a gate to get into the park. And then there'll be one gated area for mower access when we need to maintain the park, the, the dog park. Uh, my staff will have access with the mower to get in there. We will have uh, multiple dog waste stations throughout the facility, uh, which will be black and gold, which will blend in. And uh, those stations include a garbage pail and the um, waste bags that you use for your, your pet. And I have a staff, um, as you've probably seen them driving around the downtown area, we pick up the downtown trash along the post road. So this will, they also go to Salt Meadow Park to pick up the garbage there. So this will be just included in their route every day. Um, so there's no need to worry about, you know, the, the canisters that were flowing. Um, we have, you know, we have plenty of staff and they know uh, that this will be an important part of their duties is to maintain the area. So the Salt Meadow Advisory Committee is, is in full support of uh, the park itself and we've, um, if you go to Salt Meadow any day, you see people walking their dogs throughout the trails. Um, and then if you go at night or on weekends, uh, the hundreds of athletes who are participating in soccer and lacrosse um, and parents bring their dogs to that those practices and games as well. So this will give uh, people an opportunity to you know, have their child playing the sport on the field and be able to exercise their pet um, on the same location. How large is that area? So it's- uh, We'll, we'll have an soccer. opportunity for I public comment. Sure. Uh, just to orient everybody that uh, orientation here to the, to the site plan, um, th this is the Boston Post Road. Uh, this is uh, east uh, in this direction here. And, um, uh, we have our title wetlands here. This this plan that is proposed, this is an overlay over the originally approved site development plan for the park. Um, and, I, and I've highlighted in my staff report, which I will go over um, shortly, that there have been some modifications um, throughout the years uh, to the site, including this particular area um, where clearly we have not um, maintained an existing airport, you know, the existing airport hangar. Um, and converted that to a concession um, restroom facility. There have been modifications to allow um, a Cedar Pavilion on the property that came before the commission not that long ago. Um, that was earlier last year or late 2021, I should say. Um, and so, and, and then most recently was a landscape modification um, in collaboration with the Mad for Trees program to allow the, uh, some plantings within this uh, driveway area. This, if, if you're familiar with Salt Meadow Park, this is the existing grass area. Um, and, uh, 
the, the recommended location um, for the park. Austin, I can share the uh, landscape, some landscape details if you want to kind of get yes. into that. So, um, well. based off the recommendations from ACA as well, we've um, we were lucky enough to have Bob Kopta, who's a former tree board in town and an expert in all things plants and trees, um, assist us in developing a planting plan, um, which will sort of guard the Route 1 side and also provide shade inside the park. So um, we've you know, decided which kinds of, of plants and shrubbery will go on the outside of the fence. And then um, again, through recommendations from ACA, providing um, four inch caliper trees on the inside to, uh, they're a little bigger and will grow uh, quicker and be able to provide shade for not only the dogs, but the owners as well in the park. So the, the species that were chosen, um, most of the plants that were originally chosen for salt meadow are all drought, drought tolerant um, and salt tolerant. Um, if, if you take a look out there, you'll see some native red cedars. Those are uh, incorporated into this plan as well as um, some other mm -hmm. natives, uh, bayberry um, and uh, both some tall and uh, short switch grasses as well. And uh, one of the recommendations from your advisory committee was that these um, planting be clustered in, in groups to look as though they've been on the side for, sure. <laughs> yeah. for, for quite some time, yes, and blend in with the natural landscape. But Erin, they won't be confused with, I think there's some coastal woodland area there that has mostly, I think, scrub oak and things like that. So these are different. The, there's no... Uh, Proposed removal of any um, trees as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean that there's some, so those, that border of that uh, forest, that shoreline yeah, forest, yeah, that protected. Yes, yes. Good. yes, that is not proposed to be removed. See, I do have a staff report for you. Um, if we do questions and Sure. At this point, if you have any, if, if the commission yeah. has any commissioners, does anyone have questions? Yeah. John, is it? The question: What would the uh, surface inside the dog park be for, say, being grass or something else? Because in Guilford, I believe it's all mulch. So Guilford is mulch. Yes, we will um, keep it as grass. Uh, we have um, turf specialists that we work with throughout our parks in town, and we brought them in to consult on the quality of the. The surface area inside the park. Um, it's a sandy area and the grass is pretty hardy there. Um, so we're confident and our consultants confident that the grass will be will maintain itself. Um, you know I've been to I go to I frequent the Guilford Dog Park with my uh, family pets and in the winters um, in the, the wood chips sort of freeze up and um, not that it's dangerous, but it becomes a you know an obstacle for the animals. And you know, I think having grass again makes it more natural in keeping with the current layout of the park. Um, adding adding wood chips would be sort of visually um, not upsetting, but you you would see it more than if it was maintained as the grass area. Do you have a separate area for smaller dogs and larger dogs? Some parks do. At the, at the moment, we won't. Um, if if need be in the future, and that becomes a, um, you know, if the public requires that, then we would come back to you and, and see if we can do that. You know, I, as, as I said, I go to the Gilbert Dog Park a lot, and that small dog area is not really used really? too much. I have a question, Austin. Will there be some kind of signage associated with the dog park with the rules or you know records? Yes, ma'am. Right at the entrance where everybody comes in, there'll be signage for rules about um, how to you know maintain your dog in the park. Um, children, what ages are allowed to be by themselves? 
um, the you know the mandate to pick up after your dog. Um, there's sort of run of the mill signs and verbiage on signs that pretty much every dog park has that yeah it'll be it'll be posted properly. Oh, so what about places for people to sit? Are you benches or tables? Yes. Yeah, so the Madison Girl Scouts. Um, I believe it's the Silver Project. If somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the equivalent to the Eagle, Eagle Scout or a boy? So they've agreed to um, take that on as a project and build benches. We have benches that Boy Scouts built for their Eagle Project at the Senior Center, and they're they're solid, um, you know, solidly constructed. And we're going to use that platform uh, at, at the park. And the Girl Scouts are really excited to. Be, be a part of the project themselves. That's great. Any other questions from commissioners? About public, yeah. If you could identify yourself in your Diana house. Hartman, um, I live off of Neck Road on Lakeman. I think it's fabulous. We've been wanting a park for a very long time. We have two Portuguese water dogs who go to Gilbert. And um, mm -hmm. I actually agree with you. I think that the First of all, they start eating that stuff versus, and it's not healthy for them. Um, but I'm curious as to what the size would be. Because I think we're going to have a lot of visitors. It's just under a half acre. Just okay. about a half that's acre. 21,000 square feet is about a half acre. Right. That's wonderful. It's definitely big enough to handle whatever kind of response we get. Right. But thank you. Everybody. And dogs will still be allowed to walk on leash throughout. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Do you, know, do you know how big the filter park is? For, for it's just for about the same. It's uh, yeah, I would say it's pretty equal and equal in size. It'll be a different shape, right? But equal in size. And it's never. I mean, it's sometimes it's going to be crowded, but it's never overcrowded. Right. Any other questions, comments? I'm speaking out in favor or opposed from the audience. Or do we have any questions? I'll just speak Sorry, out go ahead. Else is speaking out in favor. Yeah. One, okay. <clears throat> I'll read the letter that I submitted to you guys. Could um, you identify yourself? Yeah, please? Hiram Buse. I live in Westbrook. Um, dear members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, my name is Hiram Fuchs, and I am writing to comment on the proposed dog park at 1362 Boston Post Road, Madison. I am writing to oppose the plan in its current form. Although I am a resident of Westbrook, I visit this property often to walk and observe nature. I am also an amateur native plant enthusiast and have been observing and enjoying the plants on this property for some time. In my experience, there are very few people who know what an ecological treasure salt meadow park is. Even the Google listing refers to it simply as a sports complex. There are hundreds of different native plant species on this property, including many plants that support pollinators like the endangered monarch butterfly. The real stars of the show were the tens of thousands of clumps of warm season grasses like little blue stem, which cover half the park. Warm season grasses are quite amazing as their roots can extend 30 feet or more below the surface of the soil. Warm season grasses are a fantastic store of underground carbon and are being considered on a large scale to reduce global warming. These grasses thrive during summer months as their roots can find groundwater, unlike the invasive non-native turf grasses that cover the athletic fields of the park. Non-native grasses have shallow roots and need constant watering and fertilization to stay alive, and they do not support an ounce of life. The native grasses at Salt Meadow Park are critical for insects and the birds they support. They are also essential to complete the life cycle of the northern diamondback terrapin, a state species of special concern that lays its eggs in the warm grass meadows of Salt Meadow Park. During the summer month, uh, uh, sorry, during the summer, I have seen as many as six of these lovely ladies during one visit traversing the native grass fields looking for a place to lay their eggs. The proposed location of the dog park would destroy a large swath of this native ecosystem and would further restrict the area the therapists have to lay their eggs. I would also like to comment on dogs in general at the park. Please note I am a dog person and have owned as many as four dogs at one time. Many people who currently bring their dogs to the park let them wander around off leash and frequently do not clean up their waste. If you step off the gravel paths and walk a few feet in any direction, you will see pile after pile of dog poop. This waste is hazardous to human health, fertilizes the soil, which has promoted runaway growth of invasive plants like mugwort, and is likely a significant polluter of neighboring, neighboring waterways. I have also witnessed off-leash dogs barking and snapping at the terrapins, further disrupting this fragile process. In my experience, most park owners don't even realize that the turtles are there. I feel the town of Madison should formally recognize the ecological 
ecological significance of salt meadow parks and take steps to preserve it. With so many organizations spending time and mon money creating new native grass meadows, it seems counterintuitive to take a perfectly good one that already exists and destroy it. Please find a way to preserve this space. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Um, Austin, did you want to respond to that? Those comments? Would you like me to? Um, if you have anything to say, that's great. I, I wanted to say that I did I did go back and look at the um, habitat management plan for the park from I think it's from 2012 actually. And I was I was wondering if the rec department would be working with anyone. You know, I think this is just like just less than a half or about a half acre on over 20 acres is it that's considered public there's some conservation land set aside you know, so i was trying to get a sense of what's the percentage of land that this dog park will occupy versus the entire park and and i was thinking you know is it better to have an enclosure where dogs are more controlled and contained as long as the owners are there um, rather than having people wandering around so much especially if they're going if they're letting their dogs off leash um, that, that would be my response this will give but dog owners um, an opportunity to do the right thing and not let their dog off leash and interfere with uh, the habitat that, that is salt meadow. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. I don't have enough staff, and there will never be enough staff to maintain, you know, like a guard at the park to maintain. You have signage that says, you know, yeah, that, no dogs allowed in athletic fields. That's an issue all over town. Um, but I think this. This will give, this will take away one excuse from people that now we have an area where you can let your dog run off leash that won't interfere with, um, you know, what Salt Meadow Park is in that, in that, on the other, like the ball field area and the, the coastal area where there are, you know, a multitude of wildlife that, that use the park to, to thrive. I think having the dog park there hopefully we'll do away with some of that negative activity that takes place. Can I comment one more time? Sure. So I'm not opposed to a dog park. I just think that's not the right space for it. And that park is such a treasure. And I don't think anybody formally acknowledges it. When you walk around there, a lot of people let their dogs walk off leash. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to get a lot more people coming to the park. They're going to have their dogs in the dog park, but they're also going to let them run around. Um, I've seen dogs chasing deer on the property. I've seen them um, jumping on people where actually the animal control officer has had to respond. You can verify with her that that's happened. There's tremendous amounts of garbage discarded in that park. There's human feces that I've seen in that park. Um, there's broken glass. I don't think there's anybody who's looking at this as a cohesive management plan. And I, I suggest that the town create a um, Friends of Salt Meadow group that would look to focus on the, the needs of the park and balance the recreational opportunities with the um, with the conservation, because I think what's happening is a slowly but surely it says, oh, this is a little bit more space for taking away. It's just this corner of the park, it's just that corner of the park. And I think a lot of it is just being let go. Um, I really strongly suggest that, that the town looks at this and says, how can we preserve as much of this as possible? And maybe have a group of volunteers that get together to say, you know, like the floating garbage that's all around the outside of the park. If you walk through the wooden trails, you'll see huge pieces of styrofoam that have washed up, broken glass, broken, I mean, you name it, it comes in on the high tide. Nobody's addressing that, all the invasive plants that are in there. Um, it's such a shame that you have this treasure and it doesn't seem like anybody cares about it. And I'm in that place like two hours a day, I walk there five days a week um, and you have such potential in this place. And it's just very sad for me to see. And you know, the environmental impact where they say there's no environmental impact, I don't know how you can have a turtle that's, I don't know if you've seen them there, but they're all over the place. They're in there laying their eggs. I don't know how you can take a huge part of their territory where they lay their eggs and say that it's not an, it's not an environmental impact. It's just really sad. I mean, if you had fields like around this place, I'm not super familiar with this complex, but there's gotta be a better place to put this dog park. I strongly encourage you before you approve this, that you walk that property, you look on the ground, you look at the garbage, you look at the activity that goes on in there. It's muddy. People drive all over the place. This is not a park that's respected by a lot of people. And it has such potential. It's such a beautiful treasure. I'm in there all the time. And I really think you should think about this before you do this. It, it breaks my heart. OK, thanks for your comments. Diane. Diane, um, 
and I understand your frustration, but we have that all over Madison where people just don't care. And putting the dog park is not going to change the fact that some people just don't care. And hopefully that um, it, it will be something that will definitely be used and protected by the people who go there. But I could walk on that road, I could walk on all the different streets and find dog things that they don't care about. And I pick up everybody else's. So I don't think as much as you'd like that environment, it is a special place. But we all have playgrounds and we have ballparks, but we need to, we need a spot that the dogs can go. And I think that out of 20 odd acres, a half an acre is not going to change that much. And the people bringing the dogs to the park to have them play generally came from Guilford. They leave after they've been in the park. So I don't think it'll destroy it in any shape, manner, or form. Just my humble opinion. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? I, I had a few points in a staff in report response. that I wanted to oh, sure. um, share both um, for the record. Um, and I also wanted to remind those attending virtually, if you would like to be heard, please raise your hand. Um, and we'll allow you to speak. Um, so I, I did I, I did include um, general uh, comments from staff uh, just to bring everybody forward with the steps that have been taken um, so far in the application. Um, I, I will submit this into the record and it is part of the application documents for the hearing materials. Um, it is a staff report from myself uh, to the commission date today. Um, I, I have um, most of these items we've touched upon, but there are a few that um, are not in the record yet, and I did want to go through um, confirming that you know this original uh, special permit uh, was approved by the commission in 2012, and it was the conversion of the former Griswold Airport um, into uh, which was a brownfield site into Salt Meadow Park, um, which at the time included three multi-purpose turf grass playing fields, conservation areas, the constructed wetland coastal grassland habitat areas, shared use path and trail system that includes overlooks, an elevated walkway and canoe and kayak launch, uh, an exist or ha existing hangar building to be adapted for reuse, and a proposed concession rest restroom building, picnic area, natural amphitheater, and access driveway and parking spaces for 154 vehicles. The town has adopted a salt meadow advisory committee, which assists the beach and rec department in the management of the park. Most of the park um, has been completed per the approved plan, with the exception of the hangar building, the concession and restroom facility, and the boat launch. Some revisions of the plan have been approved since 2012, including the addition of ground mount solar arrays, the cedar pavilion, and modifications to the landscape plan within the parking lot. As Austin highlighted in his presentation, he did uh, go before your advisory committee, ACCA, um, Advisory Committee on Community Appearance, for those who are not familiar with the acronym. Uh, his, his first visit was on October 11th uh, with the original design, as he indicated, with the chain link fence um, and a rectangular shape. The committee did express concerns regarding the use of those materials um, and recommended alternate materials such as natural cedar. Um, and, and additionally, the committee encouraged Austin to reconsider the shape of the park so it fit more naturally in the open field area along the parking lot. The committee tabled that uh, discussion to their November meeting, and at that meeting, Austin uh, did confirm that cedar fencing was within the budget for the project and further shared examples of the materials um, that uh, he could acquire. The committee requested an overall site plan that showed the shape of the enclosure and the proposed landscaping in relation to the rest of the park amenities. So Austin then returned to the committee on December 13, 2022 with this information. Bob Cookton was present as Austin indicated, uh, representing uh, his suggestions for native plantings around the fencing. At that time, John Matthews, an architect um, for the adjacent development raised concerns uh, via email about the proximity of the park to the improved mixed use development to the east known as Marina Landing, uh, and that's on Cottage Road. He recommended a minimum of 50 foot offset <coughs> from the closest shared property line and roughly 100 feet 
from the approved the approved residential building location for the development. Austin agreed at that time to maintain these distances and not to remove any of the vegetation between the two properties, which will help serve as a buffer. The committee reviewed the additional materials and offered the following recommendation. The committee approves the revised design and plan for Salt Meadow Dog Park with the following conditions. Increase the minimum caliber tree within the dog park enclosure to four inches. Uh, red cedar trees, in addition to the species provided, uh, proposed for outside the park are recommended. The planting should be placed in, uh, in places so as to appear they're naturally occurring. And that final determination of the fence placement should be brought to the attention of the committee. Salt Meadow Advisory Committee and Beach and Rec Director Austin Hall sought the approval of Connecticut Deep for the use of the area as a dog park. Uh, this was done to ensure compliance with deep restrictions on the property. The state confirmed the dog park was uh, use was consistent with any restrictions placed on the site. Minutes of the February 2020 uh, Salt Meadow Advisory Committee reflect this process. Additionally, the Salt Meadow Advisory Committee formally approved the recommended materials for the park at their November 28, 2022 meeting. Minutes of both meetings are included in the application materials for the record. This project is funded through the Capital Improvement Program in town, as well as supplemental funding through the American Rescue Funds, known as ARPA. This application is, again, a modification to the originally approved special exception permit. In accordance with section 4.4 of the regulations, the commission shall only grant a special exception permit if it finds that A, the proposed use or uses are permitted uses in the district, and that all standards, prerequisites, and conditions specified by the regulations have been met. B, the public convenience and welfare will be substantially served, and the appropriate use of the neighboring property will not be substantially or permanently injured. And C, the proposed uses are in accordance with the comprehensive plan. This proposal, as the property is located within the coastal zone boundary, is subject to a coastal site plan application. As such, this application was referred to Connecticut Deep Land and Water Resources Division for comments. A letter of response is included in the application documents and indicates the proposal is consistent with the policies and standards of the Connecticut Coastal Area Management Act. The state commended the town for incorporating sediment and erosion controls into the proposal and for maintaining intact the adjacent coastal forest, which provides important ecological services, such as maintaining coastal water quality and tidal estuary. estuary excuse me, <laughs> estuary environments. This proposal does lie within 500 feet of the town of Clinton. As an abutting municipality, the town has notified the town clerk in Clinton via certified mail according to Connecticut General Statutes 8-7D. No comments have been received by the town at this time. The special exception permit, as you know, requires a public hearing, uh, which provides an opportunity for the public to ask questions and speak for or against the proposal. This hearing tonight may remain open for up to 35 days should the commission require additional information. And upon closing the hearing, you have up to 65 days to render a decision on this application. Just let me know if you have any questions. Great, thanks, Sarah. Any questions, comments? That was really helpful. Um, can I have a motion then to close the public hearing for 22 25, 1362 Boston Post Road? And we can move to deliberation. Thanks. Second. Second. Thank you, Elliot. And any further discussion? All in favor to go to deliberation. Great. Um, thoughts, questions, comments? John, start at your end. The environmental uh, review, were there any discussions of species or special species? The 2012 um, plan does identify different species and where they are located. It also talks about the um, grasses that are Japanese and European grasses that are, you know, most of the airport was, I think, those non-native grass species. Um, and there was even a paved landing strip for a while too. And I think there was hazmat material on the site. Yeah, you said it was a brown. Was yeah. required as part so of it's a mix. Area. And um, I think that the town has been very responsible and you know where it's located parking lots and, 
in existing structures. And, and I think a lot of thought has gone into the, where the dog park will go right near the post road, basically. I mean, there's little concern about dogs maybe getting out into the post road, but um, I think that as far as endangered species go, um, they have been identified. Cognizant of other discussions. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it looks like a good plan. You've done a lot of work on this. And we really appreciate that. It's come a long way. Um, there's no further discussion. Can I have a motion to approve the application? We have actually um, Aaron has prepared a draft resolution for us to consider. Um, Aaron, do you want to put it up on the screen? Sure. Thanks. And we could have a motion to approve it based on this resolution. So moved. Should we read it out loud? We should. This one. Okay. <laughs> the whole thing? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, voted to the Planning and Zoning Commission of. <clears throat> Approves application 2225 CSP 1362 Boston Post Road, map 31, lot 381 R2, owner applicant, town of Madison, special exemption permit per section modification to convert 21,504 square feet of undeveloped area into enclosed door park. Application includes a coastal sites plan review as provided on revised site development plan, landscape plan, and associated application materials with the following conditions. One, increase the minimum caliper tree within the dog pop enclosure to four inches caliper. Uh, two, red cedar trees in addition to the species provide proposed for outside the park are recommended. The planting should be places as to appear that they are naturally occurring. Three, final determination of fence placement should be field state, should be field state and brought to the attention of the advisory committee. Four, that the zoning enforcement officer be notified at least 48 hours prior to commencement of any regulated activity. Five, that all erosion and sedimentation controls be installed prior to any site disturbance be maintained for the duration of construction activities and until the site is sufficiently stabilized to the satisfaction of the zoning enforcement officer. With respect to the coastal site plan application, the commission has reviewed CD, CTDEEP comments that are included in the record and has determined that the proposed use is consistent with the coastal use standards and policies of the Connecticut Coastal Area Management Act. In the event that changes to the approved plans are required as a result of other agency of, of, <coughs> of other agency permitting to support the proposed activity, the Madison Planning and Zoning Commission reserves the right to review said changes and may require modification of this approval. The final paragraph is this approval is based is made based upon the finding that the proposed use is a is a permitted use in the district in that the standards, prerequisites, and conditions specified by the regulations have been met. The public convenience and welfare will, will be substantially served and the appropriate use of neighboring properties will not be substantially <clears throat> or permanently injured. The proposed use is in accordance with the comprehensive plan. The effective date of this approval is February 3rd, 2023 and upon filing of a certificate of special exemption on the land records. Thank you. Do I have a second? I second. Janet, thank you. Any further discussion? Elliot, are you with us? No, I'm here. Great. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And no abstentions. Passes, thank you. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. Okay, our second public hearing. Could I have a motion to open uh, the public hearing for 22-30, 300 Green Hill Road? Erin, I noticed it was in a different order in your public announcement than on the agenda, but I'm just going with the agenda. Okay. Oh, for the legal notice? Yes, yes the agenda is the correct order. Okay, great. 
So could I bring over our a, a motion to open this public hearing for Green Hill Road 300? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. The owner applicant is the town of Madison. I'm just bringing over our consultants. And Bill, we have Bill Katz here as well. Kent, is Bill joining you? Um, yeah, you might as well let him in. <laughs> if he's online, he can, he can be let that. in. <laughs> if he doesn't want to, he can decline. Mute. I think that's everyone from your team, unless I'm missing someone. Do we have our... Yeah, no, I think this is everyone. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, Kent, if you want to introduce yep. yourself and... Yep, so I'm uh, Ken Gannon with Stantec Consulting, um, which is located at 55 Church Street, New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and I'm before you for the application for a special exemption permit um, for 300 Green Hill Road, um, which is to remove four existing tennis courts and replace with six new post-tension courts. Um, so I'll give a, a quick project overview, um, kind of the existing conditions and proposed plan and then we'll, we'll open it up for discussion. <laughs> um, essentially the, uh, the town retains Stantec in order to produce uh, construction documents for the removal of the existing courts and the um, design and layout of the six new courts. Um, the town is seeking to uh, replace the courts in the same location as the existing. I'm going to bring up, um, I'm actually gonna share my screen here. Um, I have a lot of documents open, so bear with me if I'm in the wrong spot. Um, so what I've got here is kind of an overview um, of the site. So the existing tennis courts are centered on my screen here, where my, if you can see my cursor, um, and they're located within the um, the school campus, I'll call it. So between Olson Middle School um, and Jeffrey Elementary School, and also Daniel Hand off to the uh, southwest. Um, so this is where the courts are located. Um, again, so the new, the six new courts will be in the same um, general area. So the existing courts, um, the age is, is unknown, um, but as you can you can see as I zoom in here that they do have numerous cracks. I think they've met their useful service life. They've served their purpose. They've served the town and the schools uh, very well. Um, but it's definitely time for an upgrade and some and new courts in this location. Um, the town and the school has done a. a pretty um uh done very well i should say maintaining the courts you can see where some of the cracks are located on the existing courts so the existing courts are asphalt and um as you may have heard the new courts will be post-tension concrete um i'm gonna switch over to the plans now <clears throat> so here is the here's the layout um, of the new courts what i've done here um is highlighted the location of the existing courts so you can get a feel for um, the size of the six new post-tension courts in relation to the um, existing asphalt courts. Um, so the existing asphalt courts will actually be, the plan is to reclaim the courts. So they'll come in with the machine, the machine will grind up the existing courts and the sub-base under the courts, and that'll be used as a subgrade for the um, new courts. Um, the existing fencing will also be removed as will the tennis equipment that's on the site. Um, and the new courts will actually be built um, slightly above the elevation of the existing courts. Um, for those who are familiar with the area, um, the courts are kind of located in a little bit of a bowl. So both off to, um, so north is kind of, we'll call it just to page left or plan left, <clears throat> more or less. So to the east of the courts um, is kind of a wooded knoll. Um, to the west of the courts is the middle school, which is also elevated higher. Um, there's some wetlands located south. There's also, oops, let me just do that. Um, also a probable or potential vernal pool uh, located to the northwest. And then there's the synthetic turf softball field um, located to the north, which is also slightly above the existing elevation of the courts. So like I mentioned, the, the new court elevation will be slightly raised. So rather than remove the courts and remove a lot of material here, um, the new court construction requires um, that a nice 
um, stone base be brought in and the concrete built on top of that. So that's what we've done with raising the quartz. We've allowed just the new material to be brought in without a lot of, of existing material to um, leave the site. Um, in order to fit the quartz in here though, um, it will require some excavation um, to this hillside. If I flip to the grading, um, as you see in the northeast corner of the site here, um, there is some excavation required into the existing hillside in order to fill, uh, fit the um, courts into this site. Um, some of the amenities and other things outlined on the plan, you'll see we have um, some reorganization of the existing bituminous concrete paths down to the park. The existing pathways are not ADA compliant. So what we've done is done some regrading in this area and provided um, ADA accessible pathways with a proposed um, bleacher centered on these this three court bay. Um, there's also a potential for some precast uh, seat walls located into the hillside over here. Um, these seat walls, per direction from our uh, wetland meeting last week will be slid over. And I did provide some updated plans um, to Aaron. So um, these have been adjusted um, from the plans that were submitted with the with this application. Um, lastly, um, there's also a proposed uh, storage shed out there. The existing short storage shed um, is in dire need of being uh, replaced. So we've got proposed on this plan a new, um, I believe, 8x12 uh, storage facility. Um, one of the other changes that we updated based on the uh, conditions of the wetland approval, um, you will see the lights shown on this plan. The lighting package that was part of this plan has been removed, um, mainly due to budgetary uh, reasons, uh, but there will be no um, athletic lighting um, with this package. If that would be required in the future, we would be more than willing to come back and present um, in front of the commission um, for that. Um, I mean, that's more or less the site. Um, the only thing I think I failed to mention is um, you will see along the edge here, we, we have this stone uh, drainage trench in here, and that was to control um, runoff and also give the uh, stormwater runoff an opportunity to infiltrate back into the um, soil. We have outlined in the narrative some of the water quality volume requirements um, and our other drainage calculations. Um, so one thing to note, the existing tennis courts are crowned um, in the middle of the courts. I'll go back to the existing condition plan. So the high point runs right through basically there. So the runoff goes either this way or this way before eventually making its way to the wetland area over here. So the change we've made with the existing layout is now the court will be um, pitched 1% in this direction, um, which fits nicely within the, within the topography of the site. Um, it also is in line with uh, standards and practices for post-tension concrete uh, tennis courts. Um, so one of the advantages you get with the post-tension concrete court is um, you don't have any jointing. So this can be done completed within one pour. Um, so typically on a, a bituminous court, you'll see some, there'll be seams um, and you'll see cracking, but the post-tension nature of this court provides, you know, a more resistant, uh, stronger court with a longer uh, service life than you would get with a typical asphalt um, tennis court. Um, I don't know if Bill, Felicia, Phil want to add anything to that, but that was my high level overview of the project. No, I captured it. The only thing to mention is also that Wetlands has approved this. So, Yes, correct. We met uh, last Monday, I believe, for Wetlands. So that was approved with um, some conditions. Um, and like I briefly uh, noted, those conditions, uh, the revised plans were submitted to the town. Um, so I believe we've accurately um, met those conditions. Thank you, Kent. I don't think I have anything to add. You do a great job. I'm here for any questions. Thank you, Aaron. Did you want to give your staff comments? I didn't realize this is our first night, by the way, with hard copies and <laughs> so much useful information at our fingertips. Um, so, Aaron, I don't know if you wanted to go ahead and share. Sure, Ken, I would just ask that you stop screen sharing and then I can pull that up. 
Um, I do, and, and Kent actually has mentioned most of my comments in my staff report, um, but to highlight Phil's uh, addition that this application does um, fall within 100 feet of the inland wetlands and water course up on the view area. Uh, so it was subject to regulated activity permits. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't this is going to take some getting used to. We're juggling <laughs> a lot today. <laughs> this is IT and staff. My, I'm sorry, it's so, so clunky here. Um, so I did include copies of uh, their resolution, the inland wetland agency's resolution. Um, most were standard. Uh, conditions that they apply to most all of their regulated activity permits. Um, however, Kent did mention um, that the commission asked for uh, revisions to the site development plans to accurately reflect uh, location of ENS controls, erosion and sedimentation controls, including catch basin protection and fabric uh, filter fence, uh, upgrading of the vernal pool location. Um, that plan has been submitted as well as um, a revised. Uh, Grading plan or site development plan that eliminates the electrical conduit um, and lighting as part of this approval and also shifts the um, concrete sitting walls outside of the 100 foot upland review area. Um, so those plans are in the record. Um, and uh, that's that's basically it. The revised plans are sheets C102 through C104. Um, and uh, this, the only last item, this application was formally referred uh, to the advisory committee by staff. Um, and at their meeting of January 10th, the committee chose not to comment because the project is located at such a lower elevation than the school in the parking lot and it's not visible um, to the public. So, um, and, and additionally, because there was no lighting proposed, they felt there were no comments needed. Um, again, just as a reminder, um, because I know we, we do have uh, some new members on our commission when considering a modification to a special exception permit, um, you do so in accordance with section 4.4 of your regulations and um, considering these uh, three findings, A, B, and C, as I indicated earlier uh, in the Salt Meadow staff report as well. I'm happy to read that, but I think I've got, got that down. Uh, but I'll keep it close to you. <laughs> so we drill it in. Um, the special exception, uh, our hearing is opening this evening. You do have 35 days uh, to close the hearing, and upon closure, you have 65 days to act on that. Thank you, Aaron. Any questions or comments from the commission? Yes. Do you have access to the, <clears throat> it's funded by the ARPA funds, do you have access to the approval letter? I was on the committee, and I think there was a requirement to have the wiring, the pre wiring included. Not the lights, but the pre-wiring. I don't know. Bill, can you speak to that? The ARPA the approval letter? Does that yeah. do that include the conduit? So I would respectfully ask you to uh, act on it relative to the planning and zoning issues. I definitely need to go back to the uh, Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance uh, to work out the funding issues because we do have funding issues. And I really don't know if that's the part of this application process, but if you really want to get into the funding and, and the uh, cost of the project, I'm happy to talk about that. I'm asking if the, the clarification on the funding from ARPA, which I approved, that's on the committee. And I believe we included a requirement to pre-wire the court so we could add the lighting later because we didn't have the funds to support the lighting now. We also and asked I'm, that capable, which we got. Um, so and, I just want my recollection. Because otherwise we lose the funds. That's how uh, my rec. I understand. And I'm not disagreeing with that. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? If not, should we open it up to public questions? I just want to make sure we speak up enough that the owl is going to. Try. Catch us. <clears throat> yes, no, but am I mumbling? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Carol, a little bit. <laughs> okay. I we think, can hear you in here, but I'm not sure that I the think we've had a chance up. for the commissioners to all ask questions and make comments. Um, so we can open it up to the public if there are any questions. And if anyone is zooming in who has any questions. Anyone attending via Zoom, if you have questions, 
regarding this application, please raise your hand. I don't know if you all took seriously see. what he was saying because I sit on the board of certain organizations and when we get the funding, the funding is very specific. Diana Hartman. Right, Diana. So okay. Uh, so I don't know if every everybody really took it seriously what he was saying. And the truth is you can lose the funding for everything if you do not comply with what they insisted that you do. And not only is it wonderful what they suggested, it's prudent financially, because if you have to go back and dig up or go near these courts, you're going to protect them. Okay, I've had tennis courts. And what they had suggested that you put the lighting in, you cannot afford it. So you put in the conduit and you run everything for it. We I, I understand exactly what uh, Commissioner Reinhardt was referring to, and I, and I believe that Bill McMinn uh, does as well, um, and understands that it, should there be conditions associated with the approval of the funds, um, and future modifications are needed of the application that would require a return to the commission. And they could reject it. They have every right. So we're not... Hey, the, the Planning and Zoning Commission wouldn't handle the aspect well, I realize of the funding the aspect. Funding. They right. would handle the aspect if, if the proposal has eliminated the conduit at this point, then a return would be required um, to both the Inland Wetlands Agency and the Planning and Zoning Commission to modify that application to uh, should the conduit be included. But the decision was made to not include lights. And, and that, that is my understanding uh, from the applicant from both the Inland Wetlands application and, and the Just to be clear, I can't, I, I can't remember if we included that in the approval of the funding. So I'm just asking for clarification if it was or not included, included or not. I just don't know. I can't remember. I don't know. About I don't have I a copy pull up, I of pull the funding. It wasn't included as part of the application materials. And if Bill doesn't have it readily available, that would have, we would have to your options could be to move forward in this direction, you know, with act of closing the public hearing. Um, and should you close the public hearing, though, you wouldn't be able to receive additional information to guide the direction. So that's really, I guess, at this point, at the discretion of the applicant, if you would like to explore the answer to that question prior to closing the public hearing. So can I uh, speak? Yes, yes, please. So my understanding is that we got approval for the tennis courts and the funding for the um, lights was not given. They did give a stipends amount for underground utilities or conduits to be put in. Um, and I wasn't there at the meeting myself. That's what was emailed to me. Uh, we don't have the funding to do the lights. Um, no, so no, no, I agree with you on that. Yes, that's that's accurate. It was just the funding was there for the conduits, the pre wire. Yes. So yeah, that's all. And yes. It was mentioned that there's no conduits in the application. Right. That, that's where well, I started. What what happened at Wetlands is we told them that we didn't have the funding for the lights, so they made it a condition not to put the conduit in. So we can't get approval no. from you. That is not what happened. It was made clear to the Wetlands Agency that there was not going to be lighting because I specifically asked if there was going to be conduit run in anticipation. And that you, you're correct. We're talking about semantics here. We know that we don't have the funding for the lights, so it wasn't put in, and the conduit was taken out at the wetlands. So. I'm looking for approval from this board to approve the construction of the tennis courts, whether I have to come back and get conduit put in or lights put in at a future date when I have a future funding, that's fine. I, I just don't, I just want to be clear. We're not putting the lights in, whether we put the conduit in, we can't put it in now because we didn't get approval from wetlands. We need to go back. So it's sort of moot if you approve the underground uh, conduit or not, we can't. So it's not an option at the table tonight. What is that? What is it for approval? And we're asking for is the approval of the 
tennis courts only. Without conduit, correct. That is correct. We can't. We can't ask for that tonight because we did not. That was a condition of the uh, wetlands. So we're not asking for that. It was part of the original inland wetland application bill. That's what I wanted to clarify. As the applicant, you removed that from the request for inland wetlands. That is why the condition was placed on the agency to remove that from the plan. You should be able to We're going around in circles. I'm looking for the Planning and Zoning Commission to approve the tennis courts as presented without the conduit at this time. Okay. You have a lot of background feed built. Oh, okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other questions Anyone from the public like to speak in favor or opposed? Questions. I don't see anyone attending virtually with their hand raised, Madam Chair. So, um, if there are no other questions, could I have a motion to close the public hearing for 22 3300 Green Hill Road and move to deliberation? So moved. Thank you, Bob. Second? Thank I'll you. second. We got two seconds. Thanks. Um, any further discussion? I think we can all approve. Move to deliberation. Okay. This is a tough one. There's a, a sort of vicious yeah. circle we're going around. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I saw it. Yeah. Is there a way to approve it pending that clarification? On the condition? I mean, the confounding aspects is the ARPA funding committee no longer exists. It was closed out. It was ad hoc. The funds were dispersed with certain. And again, I don't, I can't swear I that. That was in there. We yeah. talked a lot about it. Um, but we couldn't fund the lights. We believe we said the conduit, so it was pretty wired, so we couldn't put lights in because we saw the benefit of the lights in a great, in a great way. We just didn't have the funds to support that as well. And my concern is if we approve it and it goes back and that part of the funding approval, I don't, don't even know how that would be unfunded because the committee doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. If I could get back to the yeah. Uh, like it. it would likely require some type of modification of the permit application before. Yeah. Um, so the however, the funding, the funding source the... gets ironed out. If that is determined that that's a requirement, then the applicant would be subject to returning for a site modification, a site plan modification okay. to okay. Inland Wetlands Agency and also before the commission. Did, we, did the Inland? Inland wetlands. Inland wetlands Agency removed the conduits or they reviewed a plan without conduits? The original application includes it included oh. the conduits as um, Kent had shown in the application materials. At the time, there was discussion that there was no lighting proposed okay. and that's when it, it was uh, provided that the conduits would not be installed at that time due to funding. Mm -hmm. And so the Inland Wetlands Agency wanted the site development plans to accurately show the scope of work. And that is why the condition was placed on the approval to update the plans to not include. It was not because the Inland Wetlands Agency does not Understood. want conduit <laughs> within the upland area. Okay. More the process. So we can go ahead and vote on the proposal, the application as it stands the understanding that if they need to modify it, they'll come back without us having to put right. in a lot of conditions. Or something you can use. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Right. Okay. That's that would be the process that the return uh, to, to the commissions. Again, you wouldn't be able to approve an application with underground utilities uh, without even wetlands approval first. So okay. the, we, they would have to return to the in the wetlands agency. as well. First. Yes. Before us. Great. Okay. Any other, any further okay. deliberation? Um, could I have a motion to um, approve the application? Am I jumping ahead? No. Oh, good, we have a motion. And in that case, we have a draft resolution. Um, you can go ahead and read. Thank you. 
following draft resolution is offered, voted that the Madison Planning and Zoning Commission approve application number 22 30, 300 Greenhead Road, Matt 34, Lot 36, RU2, owner applicant, Town of Madison, a special exception permit, which remove four existing tennis courts and replaced with six courts as detailed in the site development plans by Stantec Consulting Services Incorporated. Sheet C100 through C-104 and sheets C301 through C-305, excluding sheet E100, dated 11-28-22, with sheet C-102-C, 104 revised to 117-23 with the following conditions. One, the applicant shall notify the zoning enforcement officer at least 48 hours prior to commencement of any construction activities. Two, at all times during the site work and until soil areas are stabilized, the applicant shall install and maintain erosion and sediment control measures such as a fabric filter fence, staked hay bales, or other measures deemed necessary by the agency's agent to prevent erosion and sedimentation impacts to the wetlands and watercourses. Three, erosion control and soil stabilization measures shall comply with the approved plan and the guidelines established in the Connecticut Guidelines for Soil Erosion and Sediment Control 2020-02. The 30-foot side yard setback along the Eastern property line boundary shall be field staked by a CT, a Connecticut licensed land surveyor to ensure courts are located in compliance to minimum zone standards. In the event that changes to the approved plans are required as a result of other agency permitting to support the proposed activity, the Madison Planning and Zoning Commission reserves the right to review said changes and may require modification of disapproval. Disapproval is made based upon the finding that the proposed use is permitted use in the district and that the standards, prerequisites and conditions specified by the regulations have been met. The public convenience and welfare will be substantially served and the appropriate use of neighboring properties will not be substantially or permanently injured. The proposed use is in accordance with the comprehensive plan. The effective date of this approval is February 3rd, 2023, and upon filing of this certificate, a special exception on the land records. Thank you. Could I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor to approve? Aye. 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 Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. Kelly raised his hand, yes. It's unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, can I assure the commission that, you know, we have funding issues and it, it got a little messed up with the lighting. We're going to go back to the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance to work out our funding issues. And if we do put the lights in and the conduits, we will be back in front of your board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our third public hearing. Could I have a motion to open the public hearing for 22-32, 32 New Road? So moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay. 32 New Road. Do we have we have hybrid applicants? We hybrid have applicants. property owner <laughs> here in the audience. Uh, Ross and uh, and Ross Chuck Mandel from Tom Stevens and Associates is attending via Zoom to um, detail the proposed additions um, to the welding works facility. Um, Ross, I, are you going to present to the commission or you're just going to let Chuck? Okay, Chuck, you're on. Okay, good evening, uh, Chuck Mandel, agent for the applicant, uh, clients there, Ross McCartney, the owner. Um, Mr. Uh, McCartney is uh, requesting permission to add to an existing building. The entire site right now is uh, pretty much paved. So we're not increasing impervious surfaces, although we are, uh, we do have some stormwater mitigation that we are proposing uh, for the new addition. Uh, there's also a portion of the property, uh, one of the buildings will be partially demolished. Um, and we do have approval from the Inland Wetlands Commission uh, since uh, part of the uh, activity will take place within the 100 foot review. And we also do have uh, approval by the Madison Health Department. Uh, we did soil testing though, so there is adequate uh, area to expand the septic if that's, uh, if that's the case. 
We are also increasing uh, the parking by about uh, 10 extra spaces. And uh, there will be, I believe, an additional four or five employees. Uh, this, they're not always uh, in attendance there. Uh, some work offsite, uh, CAD drafting and that type of thing. The, uh, it is a metal workshop, metal fabrication workshop. Mr. McCartney can go in much more detail uh, if you want, but uh, he's a victim of his own success in this case. Um, he has to expand his business to keep up with uh, production. Um, so, and he loves the site. He loves the site. So, uh, he had approached us early on, uh, wondering what his chances of success were. I thought that uh, it's a de minimis uh, change in the operation. It was really just expanding the building itself. Um, and so in those regards, um, there are other areas in Killingworth uh, that have larger areas, but he would like to stay in the Madison area. And, and Aaron, if you want to uh, show the a map on the screen so the commission can get a bit of better sense of things. Open you with screen share, Chuck. No, Aaron, you know me better, you know me better than that. Right? I'm old, I'm sorry. We're all old. <laughs> And I and I might add, I did get a staff report from Erin uh, this afternoon. Uh, she did an excellent job. It was almost uh, if if she's going to read that, I could uh, forego some of my presentation. Um, For you too now. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll do one thing at a time. We'll uh, look, let's look at the map quickly. And you'll probably touch on most of the report, Chuck. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not a problem. So that the uh, proposed addition is the gray, the larger gray area um, attached to the building. So we're just going to be extending the existing building. The smaller gray area to the east, I believe, that's to be demolished at some point in the future. Um, not right away, though. Um, and if you notice just to the north of that small building, you'll see two circles, um, two red circles. So. Uh, the fire department has a regulation. You have to, ha if you have to have a turnaround, if you're beyond 150 feet um, down one side of a building. So that caused us to move there some concrete blocks that are in orange, I guess. I'm a little colorblind. So we will have to readjust some of those concrete blocks, uh, mi a minor change to that. And that was one of the other reasons we had to go before the uh, Wetlands Commission uh, to, to move those, to shift those blocks. Um, if you look to the southwest corner, uh, we're showing the, um, there you go. That's where we're showing the stormwater mitigation. Uh, we did soil testing. Uh, it's all excellent sand and gravel. So that would accommodate the uh, set, the uh, addition of the stormwater uh, retention. Um, it's on well water. We're going to keep the well. And we have expansion for the septic if need be, just to the south of the new addition. And you can see the uh, you can see that's the proposed septic area. The building that's gonna be demolished, that will be replaced with, uh, at, with uh, bituminous uh, parking. So that will remain uh, impervious. We have the railroad runs to the south of us. There is a large, uh, well, I was gonna say swampy area, but I don't wanna say that with it, a large wetland area to the east. Um, so there's no neighbors at all. And to the west, uh, it's a current industrial use right now. And I will entertain any questions. If anyone has any, if I can't answer them, uh, perhaps Mr. McCartney can answer. Thank you, Aaron. Did you want to add anything? Um, no, I did draft a staff report. In that report, I included the conditions um, that the Inland Wetlands Agency placed on the regulated activity permit. Um, standard ENS controls, um, limiting locations for stockpiling of materials, um, and uh, lastly, that the applicant um, submit a, a maintenance plan for the stormwater management system um, prior to any site disturbance. Um, and my only other comment um, is again that this is a, is a modification to a special exception permit um, as all uses within the light industrial zone are permitted by special exception. Um, and so that is why the applicant is before you today. And uh, so you will again be acting in accordance with section 4.4 of the regulations um, uh, with your considerations uh, in granting that special permit application. Again, tonight is the first night of the hearing. 
can hold it open for 35 days. And upon closure, you have 65 days to act on the application. Thank you. Great. Any questions or comments from commissioners? I wanted to make one quick comment that um, I rode my bike by <laughs> by yesterday, and I noticed that on the on the railroad side of the property, basically the south side of the property, it's elevated. You can't even see the welding works from like from Scotland Road there. Um, so uh, I just wanted to add that. And couldn't couldn't really get that sense from the plans or from the, um, what you've presented so far, but it, I think it won't be visible at all, really. <laughs> Yeah, Chuck, Chuck Mandel here. You, you are correct, uh, Madam Chairman. The the entire new building will be shielded by the existing building, so nothing will be seen. That's why I mentioned the uh, wetlands to the east and the railroad and um, current industrial use. Thank you. Um, and also for that reason, this um, application was not referred to your advisory committee, right? Um, because the yeah, you're not yeah. going to see it. <laughs> yeah. I just had a comment. I'm glad you're staying in Madison and not going to kill anyone. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a great example of let's not hassle somebody who's doing everything right. The phrase <laughs> de minimis, I, I heard. And that seems to be accurate. But. Okay, can I have a motion to close the public hearing and um, move to deliberation? We sort of did that already, I guess. Deliberated. Any other further deliberation? Oh, yeah, sorry. Second. Second. No further discussion and all in favor deliberation. Any further deliberation, comments, thoughts? I have a motion to move to a vote. And we have, we do have a draft here, draft resolution. The motion to approve. So moved. Janet, you get to read it. <laughs> Thank you. Great feeling now, Janet. <laughs> Uh, the following resolution is offered, voted that the Madison Planning and Zoning Commission approve application number 223232 New Road, Map 49, Lot 25, Light Industrial Zone. Applicant Thomas A. Stevens and Associates Incorporated, owner RWT Corporation, special exception application for section 7.1 to construct 60 foot by 114 foot, 680 Oh, excuse me, 6,802 square feet, one story addition to rear of existing manufacturing building, demolition of 1,351 square foot portion of rear detached building as shown on site development plan prepared by Thomas A. Stevens and Associates, dated 11.02.22, with the following conditions. One, that the zoning enforcement officer be notified at least 48 hours prior to commencement of any construction activity, two, that all erosion and sedimentation controls be installed prior to any site disturbance and be maintained for the duration of construction activities and until the site is sufficiently stabilized to the satisfaction of the zoning enforcement officer. And three, a condensed inspection and maintenance chart shall be prepared by the design engineer identifying the inspection management and maintenance frequency required for each component of the stormwater treatment system. This chart shall be submitted to the zoning enforcement officer prior to issuance of a preliminary certificate of zoning compliance. In the event that changes to the approved plans are required as a result of other agency permitting to support the proposed activity, the Madison Planning and Zoning Commission reserves the right to review said changes and may require modification of this approval this approval is made based upon the finding that the proposed use is a permitted use in the district and that the standards prerequisites and conditions specified by the regulations have been met. The public convenience and welfare will be substantially served and the appropriate use of neighboring properties will not be substantially or permanently injured. The proposed use is in accordance with the comprehensive plan. The effective date of this approval is February 3rd 2023, and upon filing of the certificate of special exception on the land records. Thank you, Janet. Can I have a second? Thank you. Further discussion? All in favor of approval? Aye. Unanimous? Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, can I have a motion then to open our fourth public hearing, which is for 22-33. The applicant is Fraser Lulage. Petition for regulation amendment to Madison Zoning Regulation Section 32 Plan Development District. Motion to open. Thank you. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Okay, we're open. And we have our applicants, applicants coming to join us. Um, Attorney Jeff Beatty is here on behalf of Fraser Roulage. I don't know. Frazier here, Jeff, so I think it's just you, yes? He's sitting here right next to me. Oh, well, there we go. He is here. We can't see you. We can only hear you. Okay, there you go. There you go. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Jeffrey Beatty. I'm with the firm of Sullivan, Griffith & Beatty in Gil 705 Boston Post Road in Guilford. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, Fraser Lulaj, who's seated to my left. Um, this is our attempt to present a revised text amendment to section 32 of the uh, section 32.3.2 of the Madison Zoning Regulations to permit uh, additional properties to be considered uh, for uh, by the commission for uh, plan development districts. <clears throat> Following last month's meeting, you may recall uh, the feedback that we got from the commission and the members of the public was that the tax amendment that we had proposed was too broad uh, and, inco and incorporated uh, more properties than the, the town, the number of town residents felt was appropriate and, and certainly the members of the commission felt appropriate. So we revised the amendment uh, and the text amendment as pre presented, <coughs> uh, subsection A says is, is language directly from the existing regulation and that uh, properties to be considered for PDDs uh, must be located within an area specifically designated as a future development opportunity in the 2013 POCD or a successor document, that's language directly from the existing regulations. The two new sections are subsection B, which is land currently devoted to club or other non-conforming use adjacent to residential uses, or subsection C, land with any property line located within 400 feet of the commercial, the C district or the light industrial LI district. That's the extent of the text amendment, and we've uh, attempted to reduce the number of el eligible properties to uh, properties that would be close to the commercial or light industrial districts and not as broad a, a number as was presented last month. It's our effort to include the Winter Club project property uh, within uh, the category of properties that would be eligible for consideration by this board for a planned development district uh, and some additional properties that the commission has identified uh, uh, in its um, uh, minutes of its December uh, 2020 uh, meeting as potential opportunity areas for planned development districts uh, in the future. Um, I would like to point out that- Could, Can I just interrupt for one second? Sorry. Um, Absolutely. I just wondered if we put that text up on the screen to share. Sure. The proposed, the proposed text, text amendment. Yes. Yeah. So I, I do have that in my staff report to share. Um, Sorry to interrupt. I was trying to get attention before, but. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you. That might be an older one, Aaron. No, this is part. This is included in my staff report, which I will read once Jeff um, okay. has had an opportunity. Okay, so, great. But I'll just screen share that portion of it so that you can read what this proposal. Uh, it's basically this section here. The area in red is the new language that um, Jeff just, uh, excuse me, Attorney B just uh, detailed here. It's A, B, and C. 
of section D, subsection II. Got it, thanks. And just to reiterate, uh, if you'll notice the uh, language that's stricken out after the two little eyes is uh, nearly identical to subsection A of what's proposed for the tax amendment. That's the part that I was referencing where we incorporated the existing language into the proposed amendment. So subsections B and C are really the new text that we're looking to add, have added to the regulations uh, and the properties that fall within those categories would then be eligible to come before the Planning and Zoning Commission for consideration as a planned development district. One of the other things that was that I'd like to address is that the amendment of the regulations as we've proposed them and any modifications that might be made based on comments from uh, uh, Ms. Mannix as well as the uh, regional government, it, it, if we alter it, we're willing to consider uh, limiting it further if, if you feel that this uh, amendment is too broad. We again tried to strike a balance between just designating the Winter Club property as eligible for consideration as a PDD and some other properties that the commission had identified uh, or, or that the commission may feel would be worth worth uh, or, or the property owners, I should say, may want to present to this commission for consideration as a PDD. So we were trying to avoid just limiting it to the Winter Club property, although we're happy to limit it just to the Winter Club property if that <laughs> is uh, satisfactory to commission. Um, our goal, my client is uh, anxious to, re to move forward with this and we're trying to do it in a way that accommodates um, that goal and gives the commission some flexibility with regard to other properties. I, I would also like to point out that <clears throat> um, I wanted to try and address some misperceptions that uh, the public may have with regard to the process associated with approving a planned development district. The text amendment allows additional properties to be considered by the Planning and Zoning Commission for a planned development district. It does not mean that those properties will automatically be approved as a planned development district. If the commission adopts an amendment that allows a property to be considered eligible for consideration as a planned development district, that property owner needs to come back before this commission and satisfy criteria that are already in your regulations that gives this commission, in my opinion, a great amount of discretion as to whether or not to approve a designation of a property as a planned development district. And I refer to section 32.2.1 uh, of your regulations, and I don't know um, if they're available for a review, but the criteria, the, 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 the relevant portion of the regs that I'd like to just reiterate to the commission, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but members of the public who may be watching this uh, hearing may not be familiar with, these are the factors that this commission, that your commission needs to consider in approving a map amendment to, to plan development districts. So this is what you need to, this is what the commission needs to think about before approving an application for any property, whether it's the Winter Club or any other property that falls within the criteria for approval as a planned development district. The first is subsection A, that the location uses the that the location uses and layout of the proposed PDD are in conformance with the intent of and the goals and objectives contained in the plan of conservation of development. So that's a threshold criteria that the Pl Planning and Zoning Commission has to determine if it's going to approve an application for a PDD. The second is that, that the uh, plan has to be uh, has to have harmony and compatibility of the PDD with surrounding neighborhoods and land uses, minimization, uh, including the incorporation of adequate buffers to protect abutting property values of traffic patterns with direct commercial traffic, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, minimization of traffic impacts on residential streets to the extent practical, the establishment of traffic patterns which direct commercial traffic to major thoroughfares and away from residential areas and provide for adequate on-site parking, prevention of glare and noise from non-residential areas of the development, negatively impacting adjoining residential properties, 
and protection of groundwater resources where adjoining properties use on-site wells for potable water supplies. So that's the second set of criteria that this commission needs to consider whenever any application for a PDD comes in front of it. The third is the protection of natural and historic resources, including, but not limited to, inland wetland and tidal wetlands and watercourses, coastal resources, groundwater resources, floodplains, ledge outcroppings, steep slopes, wildlife habitats, historic sites and landscapes, archeological and or scenic vistas. And then it goes on to note that particular care must be made to limit the visibility of development from scenic and rural roads. Efforts must be made to properly document key cultural, scenic, historical, archeological and natural resources as part of the application process and the preservation of, minim of a minimum of 15% of the site that is devoted to residential use as open space. So those are the criteria that the Planning and Zoning Commission needs to consider for any property that wants to be considered as a planned development district. So the reason I wanted to stress that, not just to the commission, but to the members of the public who may be watching this application is that the text amendment that we're proposing is, is narrower in terms of the number of properties that will be eligible uh, for the consideration as a PDD, but it doesn't mean that those properties are automatically gonna be approved as PDDs. The, the Planning and Zoning Commission still needs to consider all of those criteria that I just recited. And in the context of each property, a master plan needs to be presented with the application to demonstrate the intended use, all those criteria that I just mentioned, mentioned as well as lighting, parking, um, uh, sanit, uh, uh, sept septic systems, all, uh, hours of operation, all those things need to come before the Planning and Zoning Commission, who, which then has the discretion to say, yeah, we think that's a good use for this site, or no, we don't think it's a good use for this site, so we're going to deny your application for a planned development district. It's not a rubber stamp or, uh, or, or, or tying the hands of the Planning and Zoning Commission with regard to any of the properties that might be eligible for a PDD. And so there was a fair amount of concern that last month's proposal was going to uh, somehow prevent the Planning and Zoning Commission from prohibiting unintended or undesired development of eligible properties. And I think it's fairly clear from what I just read and which, which is already a part of your regulations and which is not being amended in any way by the proposed text amendment that the Planning and Zoning Commission retains a great deal of authority on a case-by-case -case basis to review the applications that come before it. And so the goal here, if I, if, if, if I could try to uh, explain it just a little more clear, uh, a little clearly for the folks who are, are, are watching is that this amendment will allow the Winter Club as well as several other properties that now don't fall within the existing requirement of the regulations, which is that they have to be identified in the plan of conservation in, in the 2002, they have to be an area specifically designated as a future development opportunity in the 2013 plan of conservation development or a successor document. There, there aren't that many properties that fall within that category that satisfy that criteria that are even eligible to be considered by the Planning and Zoning Commission for a PDD. What we're trying to do is expand the number of properties that are now eligible for consideration for the Planning and Zoning Commission. That doesn't mean that the Planning and Zoning Commission has to approve them. It just means that they can consider them now, whereas under the existing regulations, they can't. And so that's what our goal is with the planning, with the proposed text amendment. It's not, we want to come in and, 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 and open the doors for un, unrestrained uh, uh, development of sites throughout the town. We've reduced the scale to reduce the number of properties that may be eligible. Um, and, but, but, but neither last month's application nor this application intended and had any desire to restrain or, 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 or restrict or limit the already mm -hmm. substantial review uh, uh, authority of the Planning and Zoning Commission when it comes to an application for a PDD. And I, I, I don't know how, if I can say it any clearer than that, other than this mm -hmm. commission continues to retain a great deal of authority on a case-by-case -case basis as 
individual property applications are presented to it. That was never the intention uh, to, to deprive the commission of that authority then, uh, last month, and it's certainly not the intention now. And so I don't want uh, folks to think that this is some sort of you know, bait and switch uh, approach to uh, deceive people into thinking that, oh, we're just you know, asking for the winter club and all these, and that's going to uh, mean that there's all sorts of other development that's going to take place without any control or restraint imposed by the planning and zoning con zoning commission. That's not that's not accurate by any shape of by any by any shape of uh, of, of argument. And so I just I just wanted it to be clear that we're not trying to do anything to prevent this commission from reviewing if the commission adopts this text amendment or adopts it with a slight modification that would allow, would continue to allow my client to come back with a plan, that's what's going to happen. We will come back with a master plan for the winter club property, satisfying the criteria of 32.2.1 and also going into the great detail uh, of what's required in a master plan that's already a part of your regulations so that the commission has a very clear understanding of what's being proposed to be built, what the impact will be on the, on the neighbors, what the impact will be on the town as a whole, and whether or not that particular use for that particular site is appropriate. That's all we want to have happen. That's all we've ever wanted to have happen. We just want the opportunity to come in and present it to this commission. And so I just, I, I, uh, last month's hearing uh, was, um, was troubling because it's never been our intention to do anything other than say, we'd like the opportunity to come before this commission and, and to allow other property owners to come before the commission with a specific plan for a property that may not otherwise mm -hmm. be permitted under the zoning regulations, but not depriving the commission of the ability to say, yeah, we think that's a good use of the property or no, we don't think that's a good use of the property. You need to either come up with a different plan or it's never gonna be approved. So I'm sorry, I, I rattled on for a little bit there, but I really wanted to make it clear that we're not trying to restrain the commission's review authority with regard to this or any other application that may become before it if this tax amendment gets adopted. So, okay, um, if I may add, please, just a couple of words. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Again, first of all, uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah, Frances uh, probably uh, Francesco Frasch, Lulai, the applicant here. Um, what have made me come uh, again in front of you here for a third time is we never had anybody against this uh, project from day one. Not even one person, a neighbor or anybody from the town. If we had some kind of opposition from for a winter club to become a restaurant, I, I won't be here today. So that's that's the main reason why I'm still here and, and pursuing it. And I hope you take that in consideration and uh, vote pro. Thank you. And, and, and the other reason we've drafted it the way we have is although our primary focus is on the winter club, what we were hoping to avoid and what I think the Planning and Zoning Commission and the town planner are hoping to avoid is you having to go through a similar process on a property by property basis uh, whenever someone else has a piece of property <laughs> that they'd like to have developed. The PDD concept is to allow properties that fall within certain criteria to come before you to say, hey, we're not allowed to do this under your existing regulations. We'd like you to consider this proposed use for this site. And it allows you, it gives you greater flexibility uh, to, to do that. And we're just, our goal was to expand the number of properties, not just for the winter club, but for other properties that have been identified throughout town as potential opportunity areas. Obviously we want it to be applicable to the winter club first and foremost, but we were, uh, we, we drafted the way we did so that you weren't doing this on a case by case basis at this level. Obviously you would continue to do it on a case by case basis as addition as individual PDD applications came before you. So, that, so having said all that, I think I've clearly, I, I've tried to clearly articulate what the goal of the uh, regulations are. We did get, uh, uh, Ms. Mannix was, was um, uh, kind enough to send us the Scrog um, uh, commentary, uh, her, her memo was received. I understand that there was some, uh, there was a slight uh, modification that Scrog requested with regard to the text uh, amendment, adding the word or at the end of subparagraph A, which we are 
more than willing to do. Um, if if it means removing proposed subparagraph B from the memo from the proposed text amendment with regard to the club or other non-conforming use, we're happy to remove that as well because the Winter Club property is within 400 feet of a commercial district, and so therefore would qualify under present subsection C, what would become subsection B, if we delete subsection uh, B, uh, uh, present subsection B from the amendment. And we're also working on pre presenting so that this commission has a, and the public has a, has a better idea of the number of properties that might be impacted by the text amendment, uh, a, a map of the properties that will be impacted. Obviously we'd love to have the commission act on this this evening, but I understand from the memos and, uh, from both Scrog and from Ms. Mannix that it, it's likely to be continued, which is fine with us. We want the commission to feel comfortable approving the text amendment. We want the public to have a better understanding as to what exactly it says and which properties will be impacted. But that's, you know, that's where we are. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Attorney B. I think you've answered a lot of questions already. already. Um, and it's really helpful to get that explanation because we do have new commissioners, new members present tonight who weren't here at the other meeting. So, um, Aaron, did you want to add, though, to what he's presented before we go on? Yes, I, I just want to get um, some points um, from my staff report into the record for this evening. Um, and to, I'll back up to the front here. Um, it is lengthy, and, and part of the reason for the length, I think, is um, my goal is in staff reports um, for the commission, um, and we do have some new members, is, is partly educational to uh, introduce you to the concept of a planned development district, our current regulations, um, and and, and the goals of those, you know, what's existing in the text, the goals of the regulation, as well as your authority in the statutes in considering text amendments or zoning map amendments and what that process entails. Um, and I also wanted to just highlight the process of, ha of how we've gotten to this point, um, because although we've had some, some members, we have had some turnover in our commission, and um, we welcome some new members as well since our last meeting in December. So I, I bear with me, I'll, I'll summarize where I can here. Um, this is submitted into the record and um, in, in some areas where Attorney Beatty has already explained the concepts, I'll, I'll kind of breeze through that section, um, not to um, take longer than we need to. Um, I know we do have uh, members of the public here who are hoping to be heard this evening. So I'm, I'm not looking to take away from your time either. Um, so as Attorney B had indicated, the PDD, the Plan Development District Regulation, which is Section 32, was adopted in June of 2019 and um, has provided the opportunity to overlay a floating zone over two properties located on the north and south sides of New Road at the intersection of Duffel Road. These properties are highlighted in blue um, with a blue star um, um, on uh, this aerial photo here uh, in my memo. And these are the two properties that were identified in the 2013 Plan of Conservation and Development as future development opportunity areas. So these properties have been identified as opportunity areas and as a result, the uh, 2019 language of the plan development district was drafted and approved by the planning and zoning commission uh, to apply to these two properties. <laughs> uh, as I indicated, as several commissioners were not on the board in 2019, I'd like to provide an overview of the existing regulation. Um, and this is straight from our text, uh, in which our members here in person have uh, printed copies of the existing regulations, um, but um, all of that is also uh, included here in my staff report as well. Um, plan development districts are intended to provide an attractive alternative to subdivisions of land to diversify the town's housing portfolio to encourage open space and economic development by allowing residential, commercial, or mixture of uses in a comprehensively planned setting. The PDD requires sensitivity in design in order to achieve a development that will be complementary to adjacent land uses while advancing the town's planning directives. The process of establishing a PDD 
includes approval of a master plan in accordance with section 29 of our regulations, which is site plan review, and section 32 of the regulations, which while not intended to be a substitute for a detailed documentation associated with a subsequent site plan approval, shall provide sufficient information required to determine whether or not the proposed development is in conformance with section 32.2.1, and this is the section attorney B read out loud to you, and the Madison Plan of Conservation and Development, otherwise known as our POCD. Such adoption shall constitute a zoning map amendment subject to section 17 of the zoning regulations, which requires a public hearing process. Once enacted, a planned development district will supersede all pre-existing zoning on the specific property and any development on the rezoned property will be subject to the specific plan development uh, requirements in section 32. So it's essentially, it's an overlay zone over that existing residential parcel. So the considerations, this is exactly what attorney B had read to you, this A, B, and C about the location, the harmony, compatibility, and the protection of natural historic resources. So I'm not going to read through those three. I'll save you that time and jump down. Additionally, in accordance with section 32.3.3, in determining the appropriateness of a proposed plan development district, the commission shall consider the following factors. A, access to major roads and proximity to community services. B, physical characteristics of the applicable parcels, parcel or parcels, if there's a merger. C, existing municipal infrastructure's capability to support the proposed development. And D, consistency with the policies and the goals in the plan of conservation and development. Eligibility. Several characteristics included in section 32.3.2 are required for a site to be eligible for the PDD designation. These include A, minimum district size, two acres. So the parcel or combination of parcels, including contiguous lots and lots across a road must be a, a minimum of two acres. B, if within the coastal zone, as defined in the zoning map, Proposed plan development districts must be found consistent with Madison's municipal coastal program and shall be subject to minimum setbacks set forth in section 2.17. C, the proposed PDD must have a minimum frontage of 200 feet on a town or state road. Private roads are not eligible. D, parcel location. The lots eligible for a PDD shall be I, located in the following zoning districts, residential districts or rural residential districts, and II must further be located within an area specifically designated as a future development opportunity in the 2013 POCD or a successor document. So at this point in the 2013 POCD, this regulation applies to those two properties on the corner of New Road and Duck Hole Road. E, residential density. To promote the diversification of housing types and opportunities in Madison, and to ensure the viability of this type of zoning district, a PDD may have 10 residential units per acre. For purposes of calculating density, as defined in section 32.3.2e, the parcel area shall exclude wetlands and watercourses, as defined by Connecticut General Statutes, those are the England Wetlands and Watercourses Act. Um, and shall further exclude slopes in excess of 33%. So steep slopes and inland wetlands are excluded from calculating that density. Each dwelling unit shall have its own entry from the exterior of the building in which it is located, and each dwelling unit shall contain not more than three bedrooms and shall be served by public water supply. No wells. The master plan. According to section 32.4, the master plan shall be submitted to the commission to determine whether or not the proposed use and layout of the plan development district conform to the eligibility requirements mentioned earlier in the memo and to the plan of conservation and development. The master plan upon adoption shall establish the dimensional characteristics of the PDD and its uses. Only the uses listed on the master plan are approved uses within the PDD. 
Uses not identified in the master plan are not permitted without a master plan amendment. Below are the factors the commission shall consider in approving a map amendment to, a, uh, to plan development district. A, the lot location uses and layouts of the PDD. Okay, so this is a, another, um, these, these are your considerations again in uh, looking at the map amendment. Um, I'm not gonna repeat that because it's pretty well through those later. So the proposed amendments to section 32. Our applicant came before the commission with a recent application in December proposing a text amendment to the zoning regulations to amend section 32, specifically to expand the criteria for properties to be eligible for a PDD. The applicant proposed the following language, which is so shown in red. And this um, included, as many of you recall, one, to, to include the existing language the property must be located within the area specifically designed as a future development opportunity area in the 2013 POCD, so not to eliminate the existing properties on New Road. Also to add town-owned property or agriculturally designated land under PA 490 as shown in the 2013 POCD, or land currently devoted to non-conforming uses adjacent to residential uses, or land abutting Interstate 95, or land with any property line located within 400 feet of the commercial C district. The public hearing for this application occurred on December 15, 2022. During this hearing, the commission received significant public input regarding the designation of PA 490 land and town-owned property as potential PDD eligible properties. Concern was raised about how many properties this could affect. Additionally, questions question was raised as to whether or not the commission should be making changes to the zoning regulations prior to working through the update of the 2013 plan of conservation and development. Comments from the public also included questions as to whether or not amendments to the zoning regulations should be brought to a referendum. Please note that Connecticut general statutes provides the enabling language and process for the planning and zoning commission to adopt regulations and a zoning map. Zoning regulations were initially adopted in Madison in 1953 and have been amended through the years initiated by both the commission petitions made by applicants. In the specific petition before the commission on December 15th, ultimately the board voted to close the hearing and deny the application. The applicant immediately submitted an alternate petition to amend the text of section 32 again. Uh, this text amendment is, again, regarding eligibility criteria, as Attorney Beatty indicated. It is not a site-specific application for the Winter Club property at 251 Boston Post Road. However, this request is a direct result of the denial of the text amendment for property located at 251 Boston Post Road back in May of 2022 to allow a restaurant by special exception on this particular site in a residential zone. The commission determined that the proposal was not consistent with the uniformity provisions of Connecticut General Statutes 8-2 that requires a level of consistency throughout the district. All such regulations shall be uniform for each class or kinds of buildings, structures, or use of land throughout each district, but the regulations in one district can differ from those in another district. Please note that floating zones and other overlay districts, such as village districts, constitute an exception to this uniformity requirement. Supreme Court has upheld the creation of a zoning district as a planned development district, as they were found to be similar to the creation of floating zones. This is significant for municipalities for the discretion allowed in the creation of floating zones and the approval of specific uses within them, which might not be otherwise available in the underlying district. This current proposal before you uh, tonight is highlighted in red, again, with these um, specific changes to section D, I, I, uh, including A, B, and C. The, the Planning and Zoning Commission's process for consideration of a text amendment. General Statutes uh, Section 8-2 provides the statutory basis for the adoption of regulations by the Commission. 
in enacting or enabling or amending regulations, the commission is acting legislatively and not administratively and therefore has broad discretion. There's a two part test to apply to determine if the commission's legislative action is proper. One, and this is upheld through the courts. One, is the action reasonably re related to the police power purposes that are set forth in general statute section 8-2? And is the action in accord with the comprehensive plan <laughs> of Under Connecticut statute 8-2, this commission, as your combined planning and zoning commission, must make a finding that the regulation is consistent with the plan of conservation and development, often re referred to as the town's master plan. As you're aware, the plan establishes recommendations for future development in our community. The zoning regulations are one of the tools used to implement this plan. The comprehensive plan, however, should not be confused with the master plan. The comprehensive plan is not a document, but it's found in the scheme of the zoning regulations themselves and the zoning map. The purpose of the comprehensive plan requirement is to ensure that the zoning commission does not exercise your discretion in a manner that's arbitrary, unreasonable, or discriminatory. So the Regional Planning Commission reviewed this revised proposal as required by statutes and indicated in their resolution, excuse me, that they have questions regarding the text language as it reads, that in order to be eligible for, uh, to become an eligible property, you would need to comply with subsection letters A, B, um, C, and then this new language D, I, and, um, or, uh, excuse me, you would have to comply with with sub letter I, which is the existing language for the two lots um, existing in the POCD, um, and either A or B or A or C. There's no or after uh, subsection A in this proposed language. So it appears to be mandatory. Um, and so the Regional Planning Commission thought, well, how can you be one of the lots shown identified in the POCD and one of these others. So that, um, and, and team, Attorney Beatty uh, spoke to that and, and has volunteered to add that letter. Um, I think that may just have been uh, a typographical error. The Regional Planning Commission also raised questions as to what properties would be included um, within the uh, sub letter B language as a club or non-conforming use. This is broad. Um, without specifically identifying these properties, the Regional Planning Commission is unable to determine if there are any potential regional impacts as a result of this tax amendment. The Regional Planning Commission requests that the hearing be continued to allow the applicant time to submit clarification on these matters so that they can properly consider impacts on a regional level. Uh, staff recommends that the applicant amend the proposal to include the word or at the end of uh, subsection A, um, and also that the applicant delete the language in subsection B regarding club or non conforming use. Um, I, I do think that is uh, challenging for um, either staff or the applicant to properly identify, um, maybe not club uses in town because we don't have too many, but non-conforming uses. Um, this language is broad. It does not clarify whether this is a legal, legally non-conforming use or simply a non-conforming use. Um, and uh, rather than measuring set distances to properly identify these, this requires historical research on, um, on uses of properties um, to determine um, the, the conforming or non-conforming status. Um, and, and staff has not um, begun that process. Of, and, I, and I don't believe Attorney Beatty has at this point either. Um, if agreeable, the applicant should then provide to the commission a map showing the potential properties in the residential zone that are within 400 feet of both the C commercial zone and the light industrial zones. Um, the applicant has engaged with New England Geosystems to provide this data through GIS mapping to the commission so that a proper analysis of these eligible properties can occur. Um, this information, um, a map uh, showing these potential uh, properties by distance to the zones 
um, as well as an Excel spreadsheet identifying the particular property addresses have been submitted to the land use office this afternoon. Um, staff has not been able to fully review the impacts of the proposal at this time, so I recommend that the hearing be continued to allow both the staff and the commission and the public as well to have time to review potential eligible properties and their consistency with the plan of conservation and development. As you know, today is the opening of this public hearing. We can hold it open for 30 days, oh, excuse me, 35 days. Um, and the applicant has not used any extensions at this point. So there are 65 days in addition. So that was a mouthful. However, I do feel that we weren't able to give uh, some historic background of our existing regulations to the commission um, during the last meeting. So I did think that was important. I can show you um, if the commission is interested at this time, um, what this proposed um, parcels subject to the PDD changes as they relate to the 400 feet distance to the commercial zone and the 400 feet uh, distance to the light industrial zone and what that would look like. That would be great, Aaron. We, so we all have dark copies then, in front of us, but I think we should share it. Yes. And this, this information is all linked to the application documents on the, the um, that are linked to this evening's agenda. Um, so if anyone attending the meeting is looking um, to review this information um, on your own time as well. So this 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 map, um, the highlighted areas are the parcels that um, could become eligible given the criteria of. Um, now this does not eliminate or or determine properties by lot area. Um, this is a blanket assumption that parcels can be merged, so all of the parcels within a specific distance have been identified. These are all residential parcels and town-owned property is not included on, or highlighted on this map. So the hatched areas, as shown here, um, these are our commercial and our light industrial zones. Just to introduce these zones um, to the commission and the public, our commercial zones are basically our gateways to the town along the post road. You'll see here on the west end on Boston Post Road, this is a commercial zone as well as on the east end um, near, uh, you know, just east of the Hamanatsic connector to the Clinton border. Our uh, light industrial zones, as you can see here, hug our railroad corridor. So that's, that's the light industrial zone. And at this point, um, I, I believe that Attorney Beatty has requested the 400 foot distance to the commercial zone as that would tie in um, from here, let's see. this, um, excuse me, this is a commercial zone here, and the Winter Club is located here at this point. And so that property is within 400 feet of the light industrial, or excuse me, of the commercial district. So that's where that specific number, this is not an exact uh, survey distance, whether or not that can be modified, uh, you know, as a matter of feet to reduce that distance that has not been vetted at this point. The 400 foot uh, distance to the light industrial area, um, there is, uh, in my opinion, not too much science behind that um, proposal as well. Seeing this on paper now and having this list of this Excel spreadsheet of the properties now gives a, the commission and staff an opportunity to go through these properties um, parcel by parcel and see what, what this means. What does this look like now? And is there a need to potentially reduce that distance? Um, and so that's where we haven't had an opportunity to dig into this data. And this data wasn't um, provided um, by the applicant the last go around. So, um, that's 
my, my suggestion would be um, that we actually see what this means. What are these properties and, and are these um, intended properties to be uh, included? Um, I, I can kind of spot right away that some, you know, I can see the Grove School on here. I can see um, uh, Windermere, you know, these are already developed uh, residential. So some of these are, may not, you know, we may work through them um, as we get into the details, but at least this visually um, can provide uh, a sense of what that 400 foot language is. So Aaron, just for clarification too, this does not include um, the subsection B with the club and non-conforming. No, there's no way to quantify right. uh, you know, and, and put that on a map. And then we also we also are not including the downtown village district because it's separate, right? There, the, uh, the downtown village district does not fall within uh, uh, 400 potential. feet of a uh, light industrial or commercial okay. zone. There, there may be some downtown district properties that would be within 400 feet of a light industrial. For example, our new road application was a light industrial. So within a distance to that does kind of cross over Scotland. Um, however, the existing regulations only allow PDDs in a residential or rural residential district. Right, so right. these are only residential properties that are highlighted. Okay, great point. There are no other commercial zones um, included in eligibility at this time. Okay. So thank you. <laughs> it's a lot to take in. It is a lot. Um, so I guess if you, if anyone has any questions for me after that, or if you'd like to just jump in to allow for either. Aaron, I have a question or a, something for clarification. Under the residential density, a PDD may have 10 residential dwelling units per acre. There's two ways to interpret that. Um, must have at least 10 residential. So as long as there's 10, it's okay. You could have a hundred or no more than 10 residential dwelling units I, I per acre. I interpret that as, as 10 units per acre, not... So you more. must have 10 units? Exactly no, that's 10. That's the maximum per acre. Okay, it doesn't say that. <laughs> uh, I, I, that's what I thought you were you meant, but it at, doesn't say that. Right, and even yeah, with this density... There is yeah, just say no more. <laughs> just just clarify. Yes, yes, no, there there is a density um I'm not arguing I'm sorry, the open space requirement, but oftentimes density can be determined by um soils and um mm -hmm. subsurface sewage disposal uh, yeah. capabilities. That will often, you know, so you may have a, a case where you may allow that level of you know that density. However, the soils can't support that. Um, and, and in our community, we do not have any sewers. And again, that was one of the other uh, criteria that's existing in the PDD is that the development be served by public water. Water. Yeah. Was like, okay, that, that is another one. Any other questions? Uh, so many. I have questions. I'm not sure we asked them to, though. Maybe you can help because some of them seem to be okay. in my mind more regulations. You mentioned that the, there was a discussion about why do this now and not wait for the POCD to be revised. That was thought I had. Was there any conclusion to that, or did, did the discussion go anywhere? Well, so that's really, and I think maybe the commission felt, correct me if I'm wrong. At the last meeting, it, it was an overly broad uh, okay. proposal. Right. Now, that was, that was yes, the, so there is no moratorium in the zoning regulations at this point prohibiting anyone from applying for a text amendment. So if someone makes an application to the commission, you must review and act on that petition. Okay. Um, and so uh, there is a balance, though, at this point in looking at right now, our current plan of conservation and development is the 2013. We're just getting underway, the commission, in working through what um, goals may, you may want to carry forward or if um, you 
or the community has um, new new desires for the town or, or, or to shift focus in a different direction. Um, so yes, you do have that discretion to determine whether or not you want to entertain um, any text amendments or broaden this eligibility for the PED. Um, in keeping in mind that we always have to keep in the back of our minds in a community where we have 1.68% affordable housing, we are subject to, to that Connecticut General Statute 8-32. And so when the opportunities for development are limited by our regulations, you may find that you have developers coming forward uh, utilizing the 830G mechanism uh, if, while uh, adding an affordable component to the residential development, they are not subject to our zoning regulations, setbacks, standards, that level of, um, I guess, you know, discretion as um, would be with uh, that you that you could have with a PDD, a legislative text amendment or map amendment. Um, I, it's not, it, PDD is not a text amendment. Um, this is a text amendment to our PDD, okay, but the actual yeah, okay. PDD master plan application is a is a zoning map amendment. So that that is something that the commission, unfortunately, is is real. Um, in our community, and we've seen that in other um, situations when applicants have applied for a zone change on property. That application, 35 Cottage Grove is an example. That application for a uh, zoning map amendment to a transition zone was denied. One of the reasons that application was denied was because the commission had no guarantee of what would go on that property after that zone change was made. Because once you apply the zone change, any of the uses could potentially be made, whether the applicant at the time was claiming, no, I'm going to do this. There's no guarantee. And that always worries commissions. You're not the only commission in, in my previous uh, municipalities. This is always a fear of, you know, we changed the zoning map and we change the zone, what can, you know, now you open up to any of the uses allowed in that zone. When you have that master plan, you're only approving that zoning map amendment based on that specific development that is being proposed to you at that time. So that is where there is some uh, appeal uh, on behalf of the commission to, to have that. I'd also like to just quickly say, I think adding the or after the 2013 POC makes a huge difference. And also, in my mind, in, in my mind, I'm thinking that, you know, this proposal, this application kind of goes hand in hand at this point with our updated POC, mm -hmm. you That's know, right. that we can take this into account and think about it and see how that works and, and make sure that they're compatible with each other. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Yeah, good. Yeah, I mean, I can say, as you know, Attorney Beatty and, and uh, Mr. Lulaj, their particular interest is um, at the Winter Club. Um, we are aware of one other property at this time uh, who has identified a potential, um, potentially using the PDD mechanism for development, and that is a property at the Northeast uh, section of Barbary Hill Farm that was transferred. So. In reality, those are the two potential actual um, properties that have, have approached the town um, with this concept. Um, so that's, that, that's still very narrow, <laughs> you know, in looking at that, those are two particular properties. This, this particular zoning uh, amendment would affect uh, uh, roughly 710 acres in town. Um, and at this point, I don't have enough information. I haven't really gone through it to give you uh, uh, my recommendation on what I would think should, where, where we may see um, unintended consequences if there are any. So, so follow up question. Yeah. If I'm speaking in the wrong section of the meeting, just yell at me and I'll stop and I'll wait. I think we're okay. Okay. Um, it's been made clear that the 
the commission still has a lot of control over what we approve and not approve within the zone. If this were to be created and someone were to aggregate a number of smaller properties and reach a two acre limit, I'm assuming we, we can't just say, the commission can't just deny an application. There has to be a good reason for it. So if it's within the definition, you have to find acceptable uses in the, in the PD, 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 PCOD, <laughs> um, POCD, POCD, yep. um, then pretty much it's going to be hard to decline that use unless there's some other <laughs> nonconformity or some other. Is that accurate or am I wrong? No, not it's, necessarily. I assume it's even application of the rule to everyone. Regardless so of what it is. It, it, you do have more discretion when you are acting in a legislative capacity. So you wear two hats that okay. types in right. your zoning in. When you are amending your zoning regulations or your zoning map, you're acting in a legislative and capacity. And the PDD is that. Yes. Got right. Got when it. you Got act with respect to site plan applications, special That's exception really applications, you're acting in an administrative capacity and your discretion is yeah. limited to what your regulations identify one of the uses and what considerations you have. So given the broad scope of this language where um, you're looking at harmony and compatibility, the commission does have um, an increased level of discretion in their applications quite often, um, and that is supported should an appeal be taken, quite often that is supported by the courts when commissions uh, act in legislative capacity. As I, I, I guess I should clarify that. As long as you are acting uh, in consideration with that, that two-part test uh, that I identified. You know, you're within your police powers and, and when you're, yep. uh, your action is in accordance with the comprehensive plan. One more question? Okay. Well, yeah, <laughs> of course. Is this the only, this is specific to this application, is this the only way for the winter club to be allowed to become a restaurant? So, yes. So currently, and, and, and I did highlight that, the a restaurant is not an allowed use in a residential zone. Even though you drive down that western end of, you know, and there are some odd uses, automotive, there's some uh, deli. little retail deli. shops, things deli. like that, some offices in that area. A club, however, is in the residential zone and allowed use by special exception. So that particular use could come in if somebody wanted to come in for another club, could come in with a special permit use. There is no use, a restaurant use that is allowed in a residential zone. And that was the first time around that attorney B came forward. He wanted to, he proposed a text amendment to allow restaurants in a residential use or in a residential zone, but only on that particular property. And that's when the commission looked at that. How does that pass the uniformity clause when all uses within the zone should be similar? It doesn't. So that's sort of that, that concept of the spot zone. Spot zone. Mm -hmm. And so a, a preferred yeah. avenue yeah. would be some type of overlay zone would give you the most control as opposed to um, an application for a zoning map amendment to change that particular lot to a commercial zone. Again, you wouldn't have any guarantee of what that commercial use would be coming before you for an application. Or in the future. Right. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> Am I speaking loud enough? I'm sorry. I hope so. That's great. Ellie, no, your you question's really good. Fine. Can you hear Bob okay when he's mm -hmm. talking? Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, Elliot, did you have any questions? I don't have any questions at this point. I mean, the, my concern was the number of properties that uh that would be affected by the 400 foot rule. So I'd definitely be interested in seeing more detail on that. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I do have um, one member of uh, one attendee with their hand raised um, okay. with a question. Uh, ben, if you can 
can identify yourself for the record. Oops, hold on. Hey ben, can you hear us? All right. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ben Diebold. I'm a resident of Madison at 19 Woodsville Road, and I'm also president of the Madison Land Conservation Trust. I just, I'm still curious why the applicant wishes to expand the role of uh, plan development districts when there are remedies available to get your restaurant approved. Why not do those? I'm not sure there are any other remedies for us to get a restaurant approved. That's why we're here. Special exception permit or a zoning board of appeals? It's not a permitted use in the in the district. Well, how about changing the and uh, the or to an and? The property is not part section. Of, the property is not part of the comprehensive plan. The 2013 comprehensive plan of development. Well, yeah, it's a sticky wicket then. It just seems, I, I don't know why we want to expand the role of planned development districts this way when Madison is currently talking about the plan of conservation and development. Thank you. Ben, did you have any other comments as well? Uh, no, I guess that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yes, go ahead, Diana Hartman. Um, I've been a resident of Madison for 11 years, and I've watched things that never got through and took 14 years, like the, our town, to put the lights on and do all the things. And I'm wondering here, when the town really could use some more tax revenue, and we could definitely use another restaurant and we're denying a restaurant tour who has a successful business already. We pay excellent taxes to us. Why would we not even consider using that for our town? Our town has certain issues. Our town has the issues of the town itself, the little town, the stores are crying to do business. And an excellent restaurant would bring more people to help the other people in town. So I'm having a very hard time understanding why there isn't some way to get it through. Just as the person before me said, there has to be a way without changing our town and modifying it so that you get 20 different pieces or whatever it would be. And I know it has to be legal because I lived with someone who was an attorney all my life and my dad and my uncles were judges. But small town USA has to think of themselves. And his restaurant would bring incredible, incredible positives to our town. And I don't own a part of it. And I, don't, I will not earn anything from it other than the fact that it helps our town. And that's the part that I'm having trouble with. How do we make it happen? I mean, I heard, I was on Zoom with the last meeting with all the, and I'm a New Yorker, okay? I, I could not believe the attorneys from New York who were trying to strut and show their strength. I mean, you're the ones who have to decide what we're doing. Okay, thanks. Yes, thank you. Julio again, um, just wondering where the 10 units per acre comes from and why 10? So that was 2019. That was part of the original approval in 2019. Um, I, I don't have an answer for that as far as the reasoning and the discussions before that. I was not here during that time in, in this capacity um, and would have to, um, that, that was a pretend to give me the proposal. Um, and ultimately, I don't know if the commission had 
discussion. If it initially came higher or lower, or if there was a give and take, I'd have to go back and read through the minutes. Unless um, Elliot, 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 you were here. Not to put you on the spot, or you're our, our only <laughs> standing, yeah, historic <laughs> member here. Um, do you recall with this adoption of the 2019 regulation reasoning for the 10 units per acre? Uh, I actually I do not recall that portion of it and why the 10, uh, 10 units was established, unfortunately. That's three years deep in the memory bank, so. <laughs> That's okay. And there's, I mean, there's language specifically in the text that, um, you know, talks to ensuring the viability of this type of zoning district. Um, but there's no specifics of that. We would have to, sort of, in order to answer that question, and the commission wanted to explore that further. Um, that's not proposed as an amendment at this point. Um, you know, that's not part of this application. But if the commission wanted to uh, look into that, I have to history live in this that. area that is in the map with properties on either side of me highlighted in yellow, but not my own. So the idea of 10 units being able to be built on either side of me is a concern. So, um, no. And I do bear in mind that the 830G could put even more units in, I think. Is that right, Karen? Well, well, I mean, that's it's all, you know, develop, it's very site specific development. Yeah. So, a general statement of having that many units is a possibility, yes, if the soils are suitable um, and the master plan is approved by the commission, but I don't. Um, and the master plan is not a, a guarantee. The master Not plan is part that. of the public hearing process as well. The master plan needs to be submitted to the Planning and Zoning Commission at the time of zoning map amendment. So during that legislative process of applying this overlay zone, the applicant uh, and that information is, is included in the existing regulation of what level of detail is and information is required to be submitted to you so that you can have enough information. It's not gonna be a detailed engineered site plan. At, this, at that stage of the, the proposal, the commission is not requiring an applicant to go through that level of in-depth expense. However, you, they need to provide you with enough information to be able to determine if that particular uh, proposal is in harmony and it's compatible with the neighborhood. So a, a preliminary traffic study, some basic uh, elevations. Um, a, a good example of this is um, at our next Planning and Zoning yeah. Commission meeting in February, there will be a master plan, a PDD hearing, and that's for the property on the north side of the new road. And that's for residential development. So those applications are actually linked to the, the documents are linked to this um, agenda. So you could look at that and see the level of detail. It's a, it, it's not a, it, it, I guess you could call it a preliminary plan or conceptual master, master plan. Sometimes the word concept plan is not, um, you know, uh, favored, but in, in that sense, there's some basic um, analysis, you know, looking at, um, acceptable stormwater and you know, minimum types of roads and traffic, things like that. Open space calculation, um, that, that type of thing. Kevin Ovian, 317 Boston Post Road. Uh, so <clears throat> I live close to the Winter Club and I, I'm very much in favor, you know, of, of this proceeding. And, um, I am struggling also as, as two previous, uh, um, public member said um, what is preventing this particular property from being a eligible commercial uh, zoning to allow a restaurant or anything else that falls within the commercial. Um, and I guess my question is, is so if you just go to the west a little further, you know, there's 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 a whole series of uh, stores, including a restaurant in there. And, you know, I got to believe not that long ago, that was probably residential properties. 
So, you know, how did that practice become, you know, eligible for a restaurant and, and other stores? You know, um, just from a history perspective, could somebody help me, you know, understand how that happens and how, you know, this particular property, you know, from what the attorney said, you know, there's no other option. He has no option. So, is, can somebody explain that to me? Are you asking why these areas are commercial or light industry? Or I don't know. If so, on the Boston Post Road, just to the west, it continued from down from the Winter Club. You've got a, 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 a section there where you have a restaurant and you have other, you know. Right yeah, that's yeah. a commercial, that's a C commercial zone, that okay. section of town. Okay, so and my question is, is how did that become a commercial zone? Because I can guarantee you at some point that was residential. Right. So and it's a mix. That's where that it's master mix. plan, that plan of conservation and development comes into play. So the plan of conservation and development is, is, is this document that identifies the goals, breaks out areas in town, the goals, uh, and, and that particular area, this corridor of the post road, is identified as a medium density residential zone property. So when the commission makes changes to the zoning map, their, their changes can't be arbitrary. They have to be consistent with this planning document for the town. And so that's how the, these existing zones have come to be. It, it's through that planning process um, where where, um, and, and this is a very public process. This is, you know, the zoning regulations are, are the regulatory document of the planning and zoning commission or in some municipalities, the zoning commission where you have a separate plan for the zoning commission. The plan of conservation and development is a very inclusive process um, with the various stakeholders in, in our community. And that's where the commission now is beginning that public outreach to invite participation into the update. The state statutes require that the planning commission, this is a planning document. So as we have a combined planning and zoning commission, they're responsible by statute for updating this plan at least every 10 years. And so having a document from 2013, this is, um, we're in the process now of updating this document to look through and determine whether or not the goals and um, uh, you know the goals in this and the implementation tasks in this existing document are still relevant today um, and appropriate for the community. So could that document be changed and then the restaurant would be allowed? Well, that's part of discussion. So the, the, if if the, the, the plan of conservation and development just, you know, um, is adopted and identifies other uh, opportunities for growth or economic development and focuses on specific areas of town, then the Planning and Zoning Commission would go through the process of amending their regulations. You know, the regulation should be the tool to help implement our master plan. So they shouldn't work against each other. So if there isn't enabling language in our current zoning regulations to encourage the goals of our plan, of our plan then those regulations should be looked at and amended, um, as well as the map. So that that could very well come after the the plan of conservation and development update. The commission may have a list of things that they want to achieve and, and change in our regulations. So but would it come from here? This this board is right. responsible for the adoption because it is a combined planning and zoning commission. They're they're responsible for the adoption of the plan of conservation and development, as well as um, the zoning regulations and the zoning map. The enabling language for the commission, you know, one is a planning statute and the other is a zoning statute, but they. They wear both hats, and yes, they're responsible for all of those responsibilities. I just want to add, Aaron, that the plan of conservation and development, though, and the update is a community involved, has a community involvement. So there'll be stakeholders participating. We'll, we'll be having meetings with them. Um, 
public is always invited to come to our meetings. We encourage you to come and speak out. Um, is that, that's fair to say. Um, you know, we'll have special sessions. I think the idea is to have scheduled sessions for specific stakeholders, like conservation commission or. Right. So, the the early stages of this update, you know, were kickstarted in the fall, and um, so now in the new year, as the commission has kind of established or reviewed the existing plan and looked at some of the previous goals, now they're going to start getting into the the real substance of the document and and um, starting uh, with uh, whether the discussion forums or. You know, however, any planning and zoning commission meeting, as you know, is a public meeting. And the first meeting of their month, the first Thursday of the month, has been dedicated specifically to just the plan of conservation and development update. And all of those are recorded, the last ones. They haven't been all that interesting yet, but <laughs> they're just getting started. They're all here, you know, and, 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 yes, the process. Yeah. Well, they're going to get really interesting. Well, <laughs> but that being said, this, you know, that's that's what the commission will have to weigh in this particular application is how how much of the regulation they are comfortable um, or find appropriate um, to amend. You know, at this time to amend. Right. Yes. Okay. So uh, just to um, express, you know, further, I, you know, I heard the attorney say that he was making an effort to, you know. His focus was on the winter club, but also trying to make this process potentially eligible for other properties, which I think is problematic and is going to come under a lot of pressure. So, you know, I personally support the idea of, you know, this process for PDD being just the property on the winter club, so that that map that was yellow was just the winter club map and establish that one property as a PDD so that, you know, it could proceed, you know, and, uh, you know, along that, along for that one property and then, you know, at least, at least accomplish that. So that, that's, you know, I'm in support of that. Could be applied that way? The text amendment? No, no. language could only, have been only involving what he was really here for. Well, the language would have to be amended. That's not what the I know. current petition is. Right. 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 But the applicant is able to amend the petition during this hearing process uh, in response to both uh, comments from the public and the commission. Uh, Madam Chair, we have two others online with their hands raised. Okay. Um, Wendy Sean, can you identify yourself, Wendy? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, my name's Wendy Schoen. I live at 194 Bartlett Drive. Um, so I guess I would encourage you all to um, deny this application. I also am in favor of the restaurant. I think the restaurant would be great. Um, are the only two choices the text amendment as proposed here or changing the zoning to commercial? If that's the case, I wonder if um, you know changing the, the um, zoning for that particular property to commercial, how many bad things could come out of that versus how many bad things could come out of this broad text amendment, which applies to so many other properties. So perhaps you should just make him figure out a way to apply for something that only affects the winter club and not so many other properties in our town. And we do have a plan of conservation and development coming up. Let's let those people who are members of our community, let them decide what the plan's gonna be for the town. Thank you, Wendy. James Nordgren. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Jim Nordgren, 387 Boston Post Road. I think there's a real simple solution here. Everybody wants to see the Winter Club approved. And I see 
uh, Mr. Uh, Lulaj there uh, uh, being uh, very uncomfortable at, at the delays here. This should have been approved uh, in December. And I feel for you uh, the fact that your application has been delayed over and over again by uh, attorneys who want to add all these additional properties to be eligible for PDDs that have nothing to do with your winter club. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna get a stake there as soon as I can. So um, the answer, and Attorney Beatty uh, uh, said he would do this at the outset of the meeting, take out all the other wording except the word club and approve this application now. You can do it right now. You, did you want to say something, Attorney Beatty? It looked like you were going to say something. So um, when people see this yellow map, uh, I, I think the town is going to be um, outraged that some sort of expansive sweeping change is being considered. Um, I see my, I'm next to a neighbor whose um, uh, property is yellow on this map. Um, if you're really going to uh, include uh, properties as worded now uh, within 400 feet of a commercial or industrial, I count 275 properties on that Excel spreadsheet that you were nice enough to uh, put up today. Um, that doesn't include all the neighbors of those 275 properties like me and, and uh, like Julie, you just mentioned that. Uh, it, it, how would you ever be able to rationally ascertain the impacts that this text amendment language is gonna have? Um, it would take years to study the impacts on uh, on the environment, on traffic, on, on, on town uh, taxes and resources, on town services. It, it, it's clearly a planning issue that belongs in the plan of conservation and development. And fortunately for everybody, that's being updated right now. So we're comparing apples and oranges. Take the apples out, the, the long-term planning, the analysis of the 275 properties and, and other changes that that could be made in the POCD, have public input on that and, and, and take the, the other part, the winter club, and just take all, all the other language out and, and just say club and pass this text amendment and, and uh, Mr. Lulak can go on his way and we can have a stake. The, um, the important thing, if you're gonna consider these sweeping changes, and again, I still don't understand why uh, the attorneys are insisting on, on putting in these additional properties. Um, but from last meeting, it was clear, you heard from uh, 30 plus uh, members of the public, members of the Conservation Commission, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, members of the Inland Wetland Agency, all saying that such sweeping changes have to have public input. They have to be carefully studied and, and that takes time. And the Winter Club doesn't have the time or money to do that <laughs> study, and it's not necessary. So this, this should be split. The apples and oranges should be split out. Uh, the, the, the expansion of eligible properties for PDD should be carefully considered uh, in the course of the update of the POCD with all the public involved. And this winter club should just be approved standalone. Take, Attorney Beatty said at the beginning of this that he was willing to do that. And I don't know if you can approve it tonight conditionally with just the word club in there, or you have to deny the application, unfortunately, and come back uh, uh, next time with just the word club so that Mr. Lulaj can get his restaurant. Those are uh, the end of my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sherry. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. I hope uh, I yes. live at 936 Boston Post Road, and um, I joined the last two members of the public and urged the denial. And for the simple reason that the data that has only been submitted yesterday and today does show extensive effect that a sweeping change would impose upon the community of Madison. I, um, 
I probably pay about $100 a day in taxes to live here. And uh, not that I don't have my money's worth, but I do think that by opening up, um, and the one woman that spoke before the last gentleman said, uh, having the yellow on either side and the combination and possibility of having cluster development as witnessed out here on Boston Post Road at the um, old general's house, uh, begin to invade residential areas is of utmost concern to a very, very large number. And I urge you to come back to Mr. Beatty's offer, and that is strike out the language, as the gentleman just suggested, and let's have a stake at the club, specifically at that address on Boston Post Road, and get on with this with public input and uh, not have the front page of the source say that you guys are making changes that are bringing residential concerns. That's not a good thing to be said about any zoning commission. Thank you for your time and effort. Thank you. Thank you. Maureen D. Hi, thanks. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Hi, I just very briefly will just echo the sentiments of the members of the public that have spoken right before me. Um, it's very concerning to you. Yeah. Could you just identify yourself for the record, please? Sure. Maureen Druin, 73 River Road in Madison. And I'll be brief. I'm, I'm just echoing the sentiments of the speakers ahead of me. Um, and it's concerning that we're back here a month later um, listening to, you know, the same type of thing. It's a very similar um, application with very sweeping changes. And like one of the gentlemen that spoke right before, before me, I also have a um, next door neighbor whose property is highlighted in yellow, which I wasn't even aware of. So there are a lot of potential impacts on this that really have not been fully vetted. And I really think the application should stick to their one property. Thanks. Thank you. There aren't any other hands raised, Madam Chair. Okay, um, thanks, Aaron. I think we're not ready to vote on this. Is that a fair thought on my part? And the question is, can we agree and have a motion to continue the public hearing until our February 16th meeting? Or what are everyone's thoughts? One recommendation if the commission is interested in continuing the hearing, if there's additional information that you are seeking from the applicant, if you could identify those things now so that the applicant has an opportunity to work on providing that to you ahead of the next hearing. To revise appropriately and accordingly. Any thoughts from commissioners? I believe that's what we asked last time. Well, we closed it down and voted against it last time. Well, so this time um, we were they've we come back with the revised thing. language, and I think I think we probably all agree that we'd like. Well, I don't know. I can't. I shouldn't say. I certainly think the the or should be put in there. Um, I think this is a huge improvement over what was proposed. Yes, and and rejected previously. So. Um, but, you know, we just, we did just get this, so much of this information this afternoon, um, including the map and the list of properties that I think we need time to just think about it. Well, one request I would have from the uh, uh, proposer here, I don't know what the applicant, applicant is the right word, uh, is that we've heard several people have said, uh, you know, why is this broader than just a smaller area that would cover the restaurant essentially. Uh, that's been asked several times. So think about it, but I'm not certain I understand that why you are wanting to go beyond that smaller area. It, it, I can attempt a partial answer, answer, answer to that right now, if you don't mind. The issue that, it raises is similar to what we discussed in our initial application to the Planning and Zoning Commission back in that was heard back in May was specific to the Winter Club property. It was 
a special an am text amendment that would allow uh, the, the restaurant at the Winter Club property by a special permit application. And that was denied because the concern was it was just focused on one property and it impacts the uniformity of the application of the zoning regulations throughout the town. The, the, the language that you hear in relation to that sometimes is called spot zoning. And so this proposal was an attempt to try and, uh, and avoid singling out one property as, and believe me, we, we would like nothing better than to pre present something that identifies just the winter club as suitable for this intended use. That's what we've been trying to do all along. But we're also trying to balance the, uh, and, and unfortunately when we come up with something, I, I mean, I can craft language that, that, I de that if you read it, uh, it says there's, uh, yeah, it's clear there's only one property that this, uh, that, that hits all these criteria. And I'm happy to present that and, and to the commission if the commission is comfortable approving that. The problem is that if you try and create language that is broad enough to include my client's property, yet limited enough not to include anyone else's property, that's, that's a very tough needle to thread because we tried to do it with the distance from the commercial and the light industrial zones. But you can see from the map that 400 feet, which is about the distance that the Winter Club property is from the commercial uh, zone, uh, catches a lot of other properties in that definition, even if it's just limited to rural uh, uh, residential and residential properties. So that's, that's the dilemma that we're facing. And uh, my client is happy for me to amend it right now to say it's just for the Winter Club property if the commission is, is comfortable adopting a tax amendment that, that, that um, allows us to submit. And, and that's not for rest properties, that's come back with a PDD application and all the other aspects of the, the PDD application uh, that, that we're prepared to, to go through. Uh, another public hearing with regard to the use for the property and opportunity for people to speak in favor of it and against it. We're ready to do all that. If the commission is comfortable doing that, then that's, that's what we'll do. Uh, but we're, we're trying to, 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 to thread that needle because we're as anxious, uh, we're more anxious than anyone else to get this approved. And we've tried uh, uh, now for the third time to come up with what we think is something that will be acceptable to the commission uh, and allow us to move forward with a project that, again, there's been virtually no opposition to our intended use of this property. And that includes from the neighbors who were in attendance back in, in, in the hearing back in May when it was specifically limited just to this site. I just offered to do that. I thank you for your response. So we continue and ask to be even more narrow. What I think one option is to change the language tonight Oh, I can, we, can we do that? Can we do that? I, don't think, I didn't know we could do that. Since the applicant is ready to, if you wanted to work through that this evening, um, you do have other we do have other to, I, frankly, <laughs> attend I, to this evening. I would <laughs> rather we're nearing ten o'clock. So. I would rather think about it, and I, you know, and I, I really appreciate, has, I really appreciate um, the applicant's flexibility and and all of your time that you've put into this. Um, hugely appreciated. And, you know, I think the issue of doing it parcel by parcel, you know, again, spot zoning by spot zoning, whether we call it a PDD or whatever we call it, is problematic um, for, for, some, for many reasons. And I think we need to kind of absorb that and think about it and, and, and also look at this new proposal of commercial and industrial and think about that. Um, you know, I'm hearing I'm hearing the opposition and the people who've come tonight. We really appreciate that you're coming and speaking out and letting sharing your thoughts with us and that you know what you think we should do. Um, this is a lot of new information for all of us, though. So I would prefer to to extend it to February. Sorry for another month delay, but just have a chance to really understand. You know. 
but the big issues and the subtleties and the implications and and I agree that you know there's there's reason to maybe hold off until we do the POCD, but I also feel that this is the catalyst that's getting us all to think about it, and and also it will re be reflected, I think, in, in the directions we take in the POCD, how we Can resolve I ask this a question. Issue. When he was turned down in May, rumor had it, and I only say rumor, okay, um, I happen, I'm, I'm afraid to tell you that I am a full broker, but rumor had it that he was looking for 100 seats and the town only wanted to give them half. Was that true? That's no. not true. That has nothing to do with Okay, that. that's what I thought. But that's what was Ultimately, going through the town. In a restaurant is regulated through oh. septic capacity as well mm -hmm. as parking. And right. he never even got that there far. There's no site development right. plan proposed to the town. Uh, okay. But condition. that's good to know. Okay. So no, that's but not accurate. could it have gone in differently with a site plan and with the fact that has nice acreage, plenty of parking, and so we'll put in a new septic? I think we need, the, there's a lot to consider. Yeah, the merits of their specific project at the Winter Club has not been explored at this stage. They're, they're simply looking for a mechanism to get, to get there. Okay. Any other thoughts from fellow commissioners? Well, I think the next meeting for more would be worthwhile. Number one, number two, attorney media has definitely narrowed down solution nicely and laid out for us a very simple way to go. Nobody seems too opposed to it, but you highlight the problem of substituting spot zoning with spot PDD. But right. there's a precedent for the spot PDD, right? It's the 2019. At some, I think anything that attaches 700 acres more is just going to screw up a lot of opposition. Right? We're going to be stuck here for a long time. This is yeah. people who don't like yes. various reasons. Meanwhile, there's nobody opposed, apparently, to this idea of the restaurant at the Winter Club. So it seems like a little bit of a shame to drag it up too much, but certainly next meeting, we get more information, we get a more tailored, a narrowly tailored, tailored uh, amendment, maybe, and go from there. What if uh, I would, sorry, no, sorry, sorry, got two so, thoughts. Yeah, um, <laughs> we can't see next week. No, we have to change. No, okay, I'm guessing so. Um, I guess my question is what additional information will we have in four weeks? Um, the only thing we'll have is maybe a little more information on the specific properties. So it's still going to be yellow. Um, can't do spot zoning. Can you do spot PD D zoning? Spot Would this on that's this not just a legal opinion? Just that's just that. Stop that. calling it spot PD. We're not calling it that. Before. A PDD is an overlay right, applied to specific parcel or parcels. Okay. What you're looking at then is considering narrowing down the language in the eligibility criteria of the existing section. So that language right. would be what. Um, you're asking attorney BD to uh, be even come up narrow. with, <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, that's narrowed to the point of that solely incorporating that spot zoning 251 Boston. Is that spot zoning for all intent purpose? It's purposes. not, it, it's the no, the, the language the, in, in drafting this text, as, as you currently read it, it's, it's designed to apply to two. Parcels we have currently. Right. So it's completely within the commission's discretion if you would like to open that up to an additional parcel or multiple parcels. Okay. So that's not applying a, a spot zoning over the property. It's simply expanding the eligibility that includes that property. And now they may apply to you for that PDP with the master plan. Because Elliot, I actually, we haven't heard from Elliot in, in a while, and as our institutional memory sage voice, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I mean, I would definitely like to see the scope narrowed down to the point where we're not concerned with the uh, properties that can be affected by the 400-foot rule. 
Uh, I think we could definitely narrow the language down to the point where it would involve this property and maybe a small handful of other properties, but more specifically this property and uh, get this restaurant approved. I, uh, and definitely in favor of the restaurant going in that building and uh, just was not a, you know, capable of applying the spot zoning when it spelled out that particular property in our special exception. But I think he can uh, narrow the language down to the point where we could get this wrapped up at the next meeting. Did you have that? No. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I, I, you know how I feel. I mean, I think the more narrow, the better. John? See. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Sorry. Hi. Um, Joan Davidson. I live on 29 Net Road. Wasn't the Winter Club, wasn't that a special zoning to begin with to have the club? It's a special exception use club. Right. So that property went through a special exception. Do a special exception. Make it not a special. I do allow a residential zone to allow a restaurant by special exception that's applied over the entire residentially zoned property where applicants can come forward with an application for a special permit for a restaurant. So that's and even, in my opinion, an even broader <laughs> okay. change. So that's why that is not a recommended path. Mm -hmm. The club, however, was existing language in the regulations, whether it was added specifically after, you know, the Winter Club has been there for quite some time. Winter right? Club, you know, club. Was that yeah. added to make it a legal use in a residential zone at some point? That may have been the case. Okay. Beach club. Um, but it was never mm -hmm. classified specifically as a restaurant. So it's not in a residential zone. But rather than waste all of your time again, you're asking him to come back to you. Are you asking, can you be a little more specific as to what you would like him to find wording? Because this could go on for the next six months. I, next think six it, months. I think the commission is pretty clear. So Jeff, do you have a, do you have questions as far as the direction that the commission is asking you to? I'm gonna make it very, very, very narrow. Just for our property at this point, I don't want my application to be part of the whole town anymore. Right. Just we we don't. We, we want it to That's just it. be ultimately limited to one parcel that's going to be added to the list of exception uh, uh, properties that can, the commission can consider for a PDD. So we'd like to make a motion then to continue public hearing until the February 19th or 16th? 16th. Meeting. So, are we in agreement? You? Okay, we have a motion. We can't do it with our next. No. Mm -mm. We have a minute. So, second. Can I that motion? Bob Reinhardt. Bob Reinhardt. Second. Next application. I don't want to be part of any. any so Further discussion. Second. Approved. No, Further yeah. discussion. The question is trying to do that. If we, could, if we could entertain it at our planning meeting. I, I didn't know whether we know. We're trying not to. Because of the public. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're typically trying to dedicate just public here. Yes, yeah, just plan of conservation yep. and development updates. Okay. 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 All in favor? Aye. That's everyone. You want to post? Abstaining. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Your patience. Speaking of patience, where's Andrew? Hey, Andrew, here we come. So we're moving right along to our 23 01, 250 cents in rock. And here's for our next card. Oh, yeah. Hi, Andrew. 
Thank you for speaking. Okay, Andrew, are you able to screen share or would you like me to do that for you? Yeah, all right. How do you detail the site plan modification? We're on 250 Samson Rock Drive. Uh, these are Bank of America security lighting updates. So good evening, everybody. My name is Andrew. Uh, with Horton Group LLC representing Bank of America. We would like to add security lighting throughout the property. We had done two new pole lights in back last year as part of the uh, new drive up ATM project. Now the bank is looking for security lighting throughout. So we will be adding a total of uh, eight new pole lights at a 16 foot mounting height that's what's proposed. Um, this will be the fixture for the pole. I'm sorry, what was the height, Andrew? I believe it's 16 foot. Let me double check the drawings. At ACA. I apologize, it's a 12 foot mounting height. Um, yes, 12 foot mounting heights. And this will be the pole fixture, the colonial style. Is that the same as what's out there now? So I'm gonna show you a photo of what I installed that's out there now with the ATM. This is what we had put in um, last year and actually we only got approval for eight mounting height, but this is the same fixture. So you have an idea of what it's going to look like. And you have a, a photo, you have some wall mounted fixtures as well? Yes, let me pull up the cut sheet. This is the wall mount fixture installing on the building. And these will all be um, pull cut off, dark sky compliant, nothing's going to be tilted up. Uh, it's currently 4,000K on the drawings, but we need to revise that to 3,000K per ACA. So these are these are security recommended updates uh, to lighting um, that the, the bank and insurance is is seeking. The, the applicant um, came before the commission in 2021 when there was a modification to the drive-up teller um, and uh, installation of uh, drive-up ATM. At that point, the commission um, conditioned the approval that. Um, the uh, existing six foot light poles be replaced by eight foot tall light poles with decorative dark sky compliant fixtures rather than the proposed 16 foot poles they had uh, shown at that time. So, this current application um, does have a photometric plan, does not indicate any um, spill of lighting onto adjacent properties. Um, it does include a uh, full cutoff night sky friendly. As Andrew indicated, there are uh, about 4,000 Kelvin and the um, advisory committee. Uh, and thank you for the reminder because I did forget to put that in my memo. Um, they did re uh, request that the applicant um, reduce that intensity to um, 3,000 Kelvin. Um, and so at, at this point, in, in that to confirm that the lighting would be dark sky compliant and uh, uh, full cutoffs. The advisory committee did not um, raise concern about proposed 12 foot lighting, um, given the photometric plan. Um, you know, they kind of talked about how, you know, the shorter the light, the, the less distance it would cover and you may potentially need additional lights. 
So that was some of the discussion on the committee level. Um, however, the commission did um, limit the height of the polls in 2021. So that's a decision that you'll need to make um, this evening in um, acting on this modification, um, whether or not you'd like to reduce the 12 post poles to eight feet. Um, Adam, are you replacing all of the existing poles? Uh, correct. So there are some small six foot direct burial uh, residential pole you put at the end of your driveway throughout the property. Those are all getting taken out. Um, there, there are only a couple. I believe there's one in the front property here we're going to remove. And um, two that were in the back were replaced last year. So what about the eight foot poles that went in as part of the 2021 approval? Are you replacing those? C correct. Yes, that's a good point. Yes, we'd like to replace those with a 12 foot height. Okay, so in all so, there are eight going in. So your decision would be, yeah, we would no longer have any of the reduced height poles as required by the commission the last go around. They're all proposed at 12 feet in height. Um, so that's really. Uh, and they're not spilling out in residential. You on can, Boston and, Andrew, do you have the photometric plan readily available? Yes, right here. Look at the numbers. Well, but I know that there is a residential property. Yeah, what you're saying. You're looking along the property lines at the I mean, like four and five. Yeah, yeah. You see it. But there's greater lighting. Uh, is that that's on the north side? I can't read that. It's too far. Is that one and point nine? Okay. <laughs> The greatest intensity of lighting is directly around the building. Okay. In particular, the drive up in yeah. correct? Yes, that's correct. Any thoughts, any reactions? <laughs> Elliot, how are you doing? Any thoughts or reactions? You and I were at that meeting. Yeah, I don't recall exactly why we uh, why it was limited to the eight feet. I think it had to do with um, I thought it had to do with some concerns from ACA regarding the lead off of the light on the adjacent properties. But yeah, the, the, uh, the adjacent property is actually another bank that probably has very similar lighting. Yeah. They have non-compliant lighting. Non-compliant lighting. <laughs> yes, they, they have huge LED floodlights that you would never you would never pass if it went before you. Okay. Any motion? Any any preference? Or I think it's I think it's twelve foot is fine, and I I would like them to be consistent. We should be quiet like that. You know, big. And stating that they be dark sky compliant is. Very important. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my recommendation in the conditions then would be that elimination of number two. Yes. Is reducing the height from 12 to 8 feet. But add but, ACA. But incorporating yeah, that all lighting be reduced to 3,000 3, Kelvin. Yeah, I agree. So, we're, we're reducing. I'm just curious why, why the no, 3,000 Kelvin? Sorry. Yeah. They're it's taking out the 8 light. foot. Yeah, it was just. I think she said just the opposite. Okay. That was that was their recommendation. Soft. Yeah, soft. So moved. Can we just say that? So moved. So moved. <laughs> I'll, I'll even read it. It's really short. Oh, great. Okay. Oh, wow. Yes. Well, with, with, with these now. with these modifications that we just made. The light poles be reduced to twelve feet. Yep. Okay. They're proposed at twelve feet. So you're proposed at twelve feet. Okay. Just the but one. That, just that number one and then number two would be that we follow the guidelines of ACA. And reduce the light to 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Mm -hmm. 3,000 Kelvin. Kelvin. No, the acronym. ACA, A C C A. Advisory. Speaking acronyms. Oh. All right, so we've moved, uh, voted that the Madison Planning and Zoning Commission approve application 23 301. 250 Samson Rock Drive, Map 38, 551, R2 District. Owner Bank of America, applicant Andrew Raynaud, Water Group LLC. Site plan reviewed upgrade security lighting on entire site as detailed 
in the application documents the following conditions. One, that all lighting be dark sky compliant, full cutoff and night sky friendly. Two, that it follow the guidelines of ACCA and have a 3,000 uh, lighting mission. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? And it's approved. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great. Good. Okay. 824 referral. This is a referral from the Board of Selectmen um, for those of you who are new. Um, yeah, Andrew, I would just ask that you stop screaming here. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's very yeah, interesting. Someone from the public. Uh, <laughs> That's but Bank of America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. right. uh, this like brings to mind the cannabis discussion coming no, up. No, we're not going there. We're not going there. <laughs> That's <What>? summer. <laughs> Let me continue. Okay. So this is eight twenty four referral, two point three five acres from Longertown Road. Map 56, lot one, and 6.5 acres from Green Hill Road, map 64, lot 48, um, from the town of Madison to the Madison Land Conservation Trust for open space. This is related to the new schools. I need to pull up a map for you. Do you have it, Aaron? So Bill McMinn is, is here as well, and Bill is our facilities director, and Bill is uh, assisting our, our new elementary school. Uh, Building committee in in this project and has a vested interest in us moving forward here. So, as I get my map, that has been very patient. It's been extremely yeah. patient. Okay, so as many of you know, uh, the town approved uh, the referendum the purchase of the Stanson parcel uh, located here on Munger Town Road for the future uh, development of the new elementary school. As part of this, and I did write um, a staff report uh, for you, the, the original parcel was roughly 14 acres on Munger Town Road, and the town is proposing to transfer uh, 2.35 acres of this Munger Town piece to the Madison Land Conservation Trust, as well as 6.5 acres. So the property line is roughly here, uh, through the Neck River. And the town is also proposing um, to transfer 6.5 acres off of the Green Hill parcel, the high school parcel, to the land trust. Uh, the land trust currently owns open space here um, and seeks to preserve the uh, Neck River um, watershed greenway um, and currently protects more than 473 acres of this greenway. Um, and then in conservation with, uh, in, I should say, in collaboration with other conservation partners, now that um, area of protection is greater than 20% uh, of the Neck River watershed. And for those who don't know, the Neck River is the treasure just to Madison, where it both begins and ends in Madison. So this uh -huh. is our river. Okay. And some and of us grew up there. And the condition oh, and the wow. water quality uh, this was wow. an impaired waterway um, and has since, um, through these, these conservation efforts, the water quality of the Neck River has improved. Uh, so, in addition to conservation efforts, the town will benefit from physically separating the Green Hill campus property from the Munger Town Road property. Um, and this has to do with uh, public health code regulations. Mm. So when lots under the same ownership are contiguous, uh, they are defined under the health code as being um, one lot. And as there is a DEP uh, wastewater facility on the high school property, um, that would then subject the Mungertown school property to uh, similar uh, treatment plant um, as installed on the high school. Um, even though the daily maximum flows of this proposed elementary school would not typically trigger that level of um, septic system. So as a very brief, there, there are a few tiers of permitting uh, regulatory process in the health code for septic systems 
under a certain daily flow. It's a local uh, health department approval. Once you've reached beyond that uh, threshold, then it becomes a state uh, department of public health permit process. And then once you go beyond that, then you're talking about a DEP actual, uh, actual uh, treatment plant, essentially. The cost of installing these plants is quite extensive. Um, and Bill could speak to the maintenance costs, which are roughly $100,000 a year um, for these schools. And there's challenges in regulating these treatment plants, especially in a school scenario where the buildings are vacant for two years, or three months out of the year, excuse me. It's late. Right. <laughs> there was a pandemic, but that was going to say. Pandemic, right. years, yeah. Yeah, the pandemic, too, I'm sure, had, had its share. <laughs> Anyways, so this, um, although um, money was originally allocated to, uh, and, and timing to um, assume that this, this new school would require the um, Connecticut D treatment plant, um, this is a viable option to physically separate the two properties which um, could reduce the design cost, the permitting uh, timeframe, as well as the annual uh, maintenance and operational costs for the new school. So there is a benefit to both parties here um, in this proposal. And in working with the land trust, they have approved this particular plan um, and it's agreeable and actually will be involved in um, some aspects of design for uh, outdoor classroom opportunities and trails and educational component right nice. there on the school site. So it is a, is a nice opportunity for the town to partner with the trust. You're seeing this because under your planning hat, you are uh, the statutes 8-24, uh, fondly referred to as our 24 referrals require that um, municip certain municipal improvements are referred to you for consistency, you know, for evaluation and determining consistency with your plan of conservation and development. It all comes back to that book. So um, the sale or purchase of municipal land is one of those uh, items that triggers this referral. So the Board of Selectmen has formally referred this to you for your consideration and um, you, you know, should you agree that this is consistent with um, the plan of conservation and development, then you can favorably uh, approve the application and we'll send a report to the board of selectmen. Um, and then they may move forward in their uh, process of um, transferring land, whether purchasing, which in this case will require, will involve, it doesn't require, but it will involve a public hearing and a town meeting. Um, that the Board of Selectmen are hoping to schedule at their next meeting on Monday. Bill, do you have anything else? Yeah, I Thank you, Aaron. Uh, first, I, I appreciate the depth that you went in to help us with this, and I think you covered it very, very clearly, and I'm, I'm here to answer any questions. I do want to point out what you did very clearly, that I think it's a, a benefit to the town, the land trust, the collaboration with the land trust, the board yeah. building committee, the board of selectmen, and, uh, and I just think it's a benefit to everybody. So thank you for uh, the help and the time. I'm here for questions. Thank you. Yeah, this has been six months in the making here for us. <laughs> Any questions from commissioners? Uh, seems like a win, win, win. Can I have a motion? John, thank you. Gonna read second. Second. <laughs> Victor voted that the Mass Planning and Zoning Commission approve in accordance with Connecticut General Statutes 8 24, the transfer of 2.35 acres from Overtown Road, map 56, lot 1, 6.5 acres from Green Hill Road, map 64, lot 48, from the town of Madison to the Madison Land Conservation Trust for open space. This transfer of town property is consistent with the plan of conservation and development for the town of Madison. Thanks. We've had a second already, and unless there's further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Good work. Okay. We have one. It's almost off our desk. Okay. Almost, um, almost. Gary, Hill, Gary Hill, do you, I don't know what that means. Yes. So, 
Well, this is it's a lot of firsts here. Um, <laughs> what? So, um, in the process of um, accepting a road, so oh. this particular road was created as part of an approved subdivision by the Planning and Zoning Commission, um, and the subdivision. Um, My apologies, I forget. I, I don't have the name off the top of my head. Dairy Hill Extension Road acceptance. Well, the Dairy Hill Road is the extension. It's called. It was the Sandy Hollow subdivision, which occurred at 390 Horse Pond Road, which created one was Dairy Hill Road, and this was a subsequent subdivision that created the road of Dairy Hill Extension and the lots <coughs> associated with that. So the road has was always proposed to be um, accepted by the town um, as a town road, and the process in doing that, the road is completed. The um, developer has uh, had their surveyor come out and do an as-built plan and profile that's been provided to the town engineer. Um, the road has been inspected and um, was determined to be in sufficient uh, condition and the town engineer has sent a memo to the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, indicating such. So basically the, the, the procedure when it comes to um, conveying property interests to the town, the applicant submits that letter to the, the Planning and Zoning um, Department, um, draft language warranty deeds and legal descriptions are provided, they're reviewed by our land use attorney, the proposed, uh, the as-built mylar is proposed, is submitted, reviewed by the town engineer and staff and the attorney. Um, once that's confirmed that everything is sufficient, uh, then it is referred to the planning and zoning um, for acceptance um, and recommendation. So at that time, you um, would set a maintenance bond for this road. Uh, and that is per our subdivision regulations, section 11.8 uh, requires a one year maintenance bond from the date of final exception by the town. And that um, bond amount is 5% of the original bond. Um, in this particular case, the town uh, holds a $71,000 bond for uh, from the applicant or the developer for the road construction. 5% of that uh, amount is $3,550 that would be uh, retained um, as financial surety for the next year um, for that um, road maintenance. And, uh, and then upon uh, sufficient um, uh, inspection after a year, then the commission can vote to release that bond. Um, additionally, just so that you have clarification, as part of this subdivision, the applicant agreed to pay a fee in lieu of installing a fire tank uh, in the amount of $36,930. Um, that payment has not yet been made to the town. Um, so that that check would be uh, made, uh, just a, a, a check written to the town in that amount uh, prior to the reduction of um, the original bond of $71,000. Is that funded? I think it is. Oh my. Okay, so that's <laughs> a mess. I know. <laughs> well, this is what happens when we dedicate one meeting a month to POCV. Everything right. gets piled on the stand. Oh, so we're, anyways, there. we're almost there. Um, then, so upon, you know, there really isn't any more. You, you are in this particular case, you're very reliant on staff and the town engineer to show you, you know, and to tell you that the road is ready for acceptance. Um, my recommendation would be um, to uh, recommend that the, the commission formally recommend acceptance of Dairy Hill Extension Road as a town road and set the bond for $3,550 for a one year term. And I would then in turn write a memo to the board of select. <laughs> you numbed us in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we're absolutely. Yes. Right. You could have said the yellow brick road and so and so. And so, and so. If, if, if it's all officially approved and accepted, I think we would be on board with accepting. Yeah. 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 Motion? Yeah. Motion? I'll move. Second. 
Second. Elliot, any discussion over there? No, nope, no discussion. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Okay, Aaron. Thank you. Go forward. Yeah, we trust okay. you, Aaron. Now it's now it's now it's John. John in the hot seat. Okay. Well, minutes. So Secretary. January fifth, twenty twenty-three. Members present were Snow, Hitchcock, Duza, O'Connor, Beckerpaw, and uh, Bugda. I have a motion for approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. I'll second. second. Thank you. Uh, any comments or discussion? Corrections? I think there were some corrections made if I remember reading through. They were already put in there. Uh huh. Like two words that were changed. So there's corrections made for the December 15th meeting. Right. I didn't say anything for January 5th. I'll vote to approve. Hi, Elliot. Hello. Hi, Tate. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, John. <laughs> Great. Good job as secretary. Great job. <laughs> first, first minister. Um, we all want to leave, I know, but I just wanted to say that the, the training session from the Connecticut Bar Association Land Use Law that's um, going to meet our requirements for training. Is March 11th. We can talk about it more. It is in our next that's meeting. Saturday. Saturday. I'll send the into... email link out yeah, to yeah. everybody for that bar association. Some of you, if you attended before, you already got the email reminder. Um, it's a $45 fee. The class runs from 9 to 4 30. It's virtual. With no lunch uh, break, I noticed. No, they're usually, it's usually <laughs> during the Zippler <laughs> Awards. <laughs> two 10 minute breaks. Um, but, anyways, the way that the town, we, you will be reimbursed for, um, so if you register and attend, the town will reimburse you. Uh, we've been burned in the past of so we may, registering yeah. everybody and then having people not. Uh, yeah, sure. So I, I'd love to see that, <laughs> that you have a financial interest in attending and then yeah, we'll, we'll reimburse you. Can I, I can March, March 11th, 11th and registration so is. For, so I can do it for yeah. Mexico and then virtual. Yes, you can attend virtually. Okay. I haven't had a vacation in years. And I'm like, and, and registration is by February 15th. Okay, so you can so yeah, be getting email. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Oh, it is. Registration. But Aaron will send all this information. Yep, I'll send you one. PDF. Get it on everybody's radar. Great. Okay. Um, any other business? Any other comments, questions, complaints? Um, otherwise, <laughs> motion to adjourn. Well, I don't know if you guys oh, could hear it or not. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know if you could hear it there or not, but there's a pretty nasty thunderstorm rolling through yeah, right now. Oh, yeah. All right. You go outside now. You're lucky. Oh, so, oh, oh, are you parked that way? I'm parked that back. back. Oh, good. All right. Good night, Elliot. Good night. Take care. Good night.